All right. Well, it's now one of two, so I guess we'll get this webinar rolling here. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Jacob Powell. I'm a general agricultural extension agent with Oregon State University, uh, based in North Central Oregon. Uh, and just you know, we've seen wildfires are increasingly uh, becoming an issue in agricultural uh, lands across the state, especially in kind of the North Central region and in areas of Eastern Oregon as well. Um, so this webinar series will hopefully uh, help provide you with some additional information considerations. Um, so I'm excited to kick this webinar off with Simone Cordery Cotter. She works for Oregon State Fire Marshal as a fire risk reduction specialist. Thanks, Jacob. Hi, everyone. It's good to see um, everybody here. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, once again, uh, my name is Simone Cordery Cotter. I'm a fire risk reduction specialist out of the Oregon State Fire Marshal part of the community risk reduction unit. Um, and I'll go into kind of what that is um, and what all that consists of um, later in the presentation. Um, as anybody has questions, uh, feel free to either raise your hand or put them in the chat. Um, I can see the chat from where I'm at. So um, if it's helpful uh, for engagement and purposes and it's helpful to hang on to one of those, just you know, feel free to throw the question and happy to answer it. But um, for some background, we'll kind of start at the beginning. Um, the, a, the part of the agency that I'm part of, the team that I'm part of is called the Community Risk Reduction Unit. Um, and the Community Risk Reduction Unit came out of a piece of legislation called Senate Bill 762. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, that was a piece of legislation that was passed in July of 2021. Uh, and it was passed after um, the state of Oregon experienced some pretty uh, horrific wildfires uh, over the course of September um, and Labor, late, specifically Labor Day in 2020. Um, but in that great big bill, you know, it, it asks 11 state agencies to take action to kind of ensure a more cohesive uh, response to wildfire in the state. And out of that section, there's one section, out of that whole thing, there's one section that talks about uh, how the Oregon State Fire Marshal needs to stand up a team that would increase preparedness, grow prevention and education capacity, and mitigate risk for life and property loss. So that's what that's what my team does. Um, when I talk about my team, there's uh, seven of us statewide. You can kind of see you can see my region here covering Hood River out to Umatilla County. Um, if you have friends or uh, own any other property across the state, uh, you can kind of see where those how that kind of breaks out into, you know, four to six county blocks. Um, and if you're interested in figuring out who uh, if you're looking for their contact info, you're either welcome to contact me. I'll drop my email in the chat. Um, or you can go on to, you can search Fire Adapted Oregon and search our, do our field staffing map. But I'm here, um, and I'm here in uh, primarily covering, you know, covering these six counties. And uh, essentially, we serve as a resource for community planning. Um, we're resources for community educational events, financial opportunities. We also provide technical assistance to communities pursuing actions uh, to become more, fire, more adapted to living with fire. Um, and our primary goal is to work with fire districts, response partners, NGOs, and the public to become a resource. We're embedded in, the, in those communities through those regions. But we're not the only ones that are embedded with communities. Uh, while we have our headquarters in Salem, we have a, Oregon State Fire Marshal has a significant um, amount of uh, field agents out there. Um, all of these folks are living all over the state and serving the communities that they live in. One of uh, sort of one group is uh, the deputy state fire marshals. They do fire code enforcement, inspections, fire investigations, that sort of thing. Our regional mobiliza mobilization coordinators, you'll see them during a fire. They're helping coordinate all of the state uh, assets that are on the fire. Um, and, you know, they've got the lights on top of the cars and everything. Um, and they're working on mobilization plan assistance and helping local fire agencies get ready for fire season. And then my team, the fire risk reduction specialists out of the community risk reduction unit, uh, we're right here. We're here with wildfire preparedness, community planning, home ignition zone training, technical assistance, education and outreach, and community events just like this. So we're all working toward a program called an initiative that we're calling Fire Adapted Oregon. Essentially, Fire Adapted Oregon is a community resource. We focus on bi-directional communication between local practitioners and residents like yourself and our state agencies. Uh, recently, I was able to advocate um, for uh, just over a quarter million dollars worth of um, investments, strategic investments to come out of our office and be put into uh, some of the counties that I cover. Uh, we're also the boots on the ground. We're leveraging partnerships, just like partnerships with the Oregon State University Extension folks and their fire program folks. We're working to maximize resources and implement scalable projects to make sure that we're not reinventing the wheel. And we're grounded in science and data. We've got a proactive approach. 
or using the best data and the best science that's available that tells us more about wildfire and how to become adapted to it. Um, and we use that to increase Oregon-wide understanding of wildfire prevention, helping people understand whether or not their community is at risk. And if their community is at risk, how much risk is it? How can they mitigate it? How can they be prepared? And how can they be resilient when we, if and when we do experience a fire? So when we talk about being resilient to fire and we talk about, um, you know, uh, we talk about being resilient to fire, and we talk about being fire adapted. There's a lot of different things that cover it. Um, and this is why there are 11 state agencies in that uh, piece of legislation that all have a role to play. Um, you can see, you know, we've got first we need to focus on wildland management. We, this is our U.S. Forest Service lands, our BLM lands, our state owned forestry lands. Um, these are, you know, essentially our like natural, natural working lands. Um, and uh, trying to ensure that those landscapes are ready to receive fire. At the same time, we need to protect our infrastructure. I know we've got a couple other uh, folks on the call who are going to talk about infrastructure and the importance of protecting our infrastructure. And then agriculture is a huge part of this. Agriculture and open space essentially provide these like buffers and safe zones that can that can allow fire to move through them. Um, and also, you know, uh, assist the communities that are around them and help those communities adapt more readily. And then, of course, we need to be thinking about land use planning. Um, you know, I, I'm sure nobody here on the call is a is a stranger to the fact that we're losing a lot of uh, significant amount of farmland uh, to uh, conversion into rent residential. Um, and that's part of the reason why, um, especially in other states, we're starting to see a lot of wildfire kind of chew into the housing stock that has previously been on lands that haven't been developed. And then individually, you know, we've got these communities, but we also need to be thinking about fire resilient homes individually as a homeowner and as a as a resident. How are you keeping your home uh, safe? What building materials is it made out of? What how are you thinking about your landscaping? And how are you constructing that defensible space that would make that structure defendable if you were to park a fire engine in the in the driveway? And then of course, you know, day of and we're in the thick of fire season, we need to be thinking about weather forecasting, we need to be thinking about response, and if we have to evacuate what that looks like. And then we also need to be thinking about, um, you know, rebuilding communities, we want to make sure that communities come back together, are able to rebuild, are able to be insured, that type of thing. So really what we're working on is we're working on that prevention. We want to prevent a spark, we want to prevent an ignition. Um, if and when that comes, we want to be prepared, we need to be adapted, we need to be ready to respond, we need to be ready to recover. So, you know, I mentioned defensible space um, and ensuring that our defensible, that your own defensible space is ready to go. Um, I'm sure many people on this call have questions about the defensible space code. Um, I will say this, uh, we're on a bit of a pause at the moment um, and how we got there is a bit of a long tail. Forgive the dog puns, um, but uh, this is kind of where we're at with it at the moment. Um, many of you are probably aware that uh, the Oregon Department of Forestry generated a wildfire risk map last year. They released that at the end of June of 2022. Um, and uh, they got a significant amount of feedback over the, over the month of July. And what that resulted in um, was actually Oregon Department of Forestry withdrawing the map um, and, uh, and essentially going back and saying, we need to make some changes. We've gotten some feedback. Uh, they had originally planned to release an updated draft of that map in March of 2023. However, as of the end of January, as of uh, three weeks ago, uh, they have made the decision to postpone the release of that updra updated draft of the map. Um, and uh, they've done that because there's a significant amount of discussion going on in the legislature about how that map might proceed and what it might look like. So. Um, that being said, uh, the map was mandated by Senate Bill 762, and our agency, Oregon State Fire Marshal, was mandated to uh, produce a defensible space code that would um, apply in areas highlighted by that map. Um, we have written that code, uh, and that code is in draft form. We have not adopted it yet, um, and you can see it on our website. You can read it. It's less than eight pages. Um, and uh, and that kind of covers um, essentially the, the legalese of the code. The code is designed, um, and this is the mandate per the legislation, uh, the code applies to um, only structures that, uh, only structures and only structures that fit certain criteria. So the idea is that um, that map was gonna tell us a couple things. It was gonna tell us whether or not property or a tax parcel had a risk rating from, uh, I, I believe it was from low to extreme. And then uh, there was another layer on top of that risk, uh, on top of that risk 
rating that would identify whether or not um, a structure or a property parcel was in the wildland urban interface or the movie. Our defensible space code is, per the legislation, would apply to any structures that have a certificate of occupancy, which means that somebody um, lives, sleeps, works, or plays there uh, in that building. And that is also within the wildland urban interface and is in a higher extreme risk category. So those are the three sort of conditions that need to be met in order for the defensible space code to apply to, um, to a tax parcel, to a structure in Oregon. Um, without the map uh, identifying where the wildland urban interface is and what the risk ratings are, um, we essentially don't have anywhere uh, to apply the code. So um, that is why the code is currently on pause uh, until a final decision is and a final determination is reached on the map and when that map comes out. I will say I think it's important for this group to be aware um, The once again I'll, I'll emphasize that defensible space code language is in draft. It has not been adopted. It's not finalized. Uh, but currently there is language in there um, ex exempting vineyards, crops, and other cultivated vegetation that are irrigated and maintained or non-irrigated but maintained throughout the year. Um, so that would include dry land. We, um, so uh, those that vegetation is exempted from the defensible space code from any of the uh, mowing or uh, pruning or trimming requirements. Um, I will also note that uh, also exempted from the code uh, is, are any um, agricultural buildings, such as structures used for storage of farm machinery, crops, forest products, or used as equine facilities. Um, and that draft language can be read on the first page of the code. Uh, that being said, I am not a codes deputy and I am not a codes expert. So uh, if you have any specific questions about your property or um, any anything else, please, please uh, either visit our website and get more information there. You can scan this QR code or um, please use this uh, email address osfm.defensiblespace at osb.oregon.gov. Uh, everybody they would be more than happy to take your uh, specific questions at that email address. Can I answer any questions about the defensible space code? I know it's a tricky thing and I don't want to move past it too quickly. But I'm not seeing anybody on mute and I haven't seen anything in the chat. So I will um, go ahead and move forward. But if anything comes up, please make a note of it in the chat. I'd be more than happy to come back to it. Okay. Uh, so then, uh, you know, as we're talking about fire adapted Oregon and, and thinking about how we can be more fire adapted, it's important to consider uh, what ignites structures. Um, and uh, a couple things ignite structures in a wildfire. Uh, typically, the media portrays it as um, a roaring flame front, a tsunami of flame essentially devouring everything in its path. But we know from walking through uh, communities that have experienced wildfire impacts, and we know from uh, you know, looking at the landscape after a fire has moved through it, that that's not the case. Fire typically is not all consuming. Um, you know, we find these like miracle houses in the middle of you know, neighborhoods that have survived. And we kind of look at those and go, why? Why doesn't that structure burn down? So, um, and that's why it's important to understand how structures ignite in a wildfire. And it's these three ways, really. Uh, there's direct flame contact. And you'll hear me talk about two different things today. You'll hear me talk about a continuous line of fuel. And you'll hear me uh, talk about receptive uh, fuel beds. But um, there's this continuous line of fuel. This is forestry fuels that are essentially act like a wick and draw flame right up to the structure. Flame can move through here and it can impinge directly on the structure. And that's how we structure. That's one way that we lose structures. Another way is through embers. Burning material and burning brands um, can come off of can come off of a flame front. Um, I know that uh, you know we get a significant amount of wind in Wasco County. A wind-driven fire is not uncommon in Wasco County. And uh, so we get burning material coming off of this. And essentially what these embers are doing are they are finding receptive fuel beds. They're finding flammable light uh, tinder like um, material that they can land in, those embers can land in, and then they can catch fire. And then we get flame, um, and that's where we start to get flame in the gutters, in the eaves, and that's where we start to lose the house. Or radiant heat, if we have a large enough fuel source uh, adjacent to the home, that radiant heat can either crack a window, um, can crack the glass in the window and break the window, and then we get embers coming in, uh, you know, or sometimes if it's close enough, we can get, um, you know, direct flame contact. 
So that, those are the three ways that we usually lose home and we lose homes in a wildfire. The majority of home loss happens through these embers, through this wind driven fire model and these embers. And we'll talk about a case study where, uh, where that was uh, very, very clear. So what do we do? Uh, essentially to mitigate that, we have to think about our home ignition zone. We have this immediate zone, um, you know, this red line right around the home. You'll notice that in this illustration, they've pulled all of the, most of the vegetation. There's some vegetation here, but it's potted and well watered. So keep it lean and green. Uh, they've removed flammable vegetation. There's non-combustible materials rather than bark um, or uh, dead unwatered grass. They have flagstones here. So really kind of pulling anything, basically anything that you would use to make a campfire, you don't want it up against your house. Think about your home and the structure uh, as, a, um, as a large pile of logs in the middle of, um, uh, in, the, in the middle of the fire pit, basically. So reducing any of those, uh, any of those fuels around the home. In the intermediate zone, five to 30 feet, we wanna maintain ladder fuels. We wanna make sure that fire, if it does come near the home, if it's not going to get up into the crowns of the trees. So we maintain ladder fields and trim up these trees here. And then we want to mow the grass so that we don't give the echo fire a bunch of extra fuel. And then we want to prune, thin, or remove trees. You know, we can remove a couple trees and then treat them like a clump. This is a good example of a clump. If, uh, this could either be one big tree that we're managing, um, or it could be a bunch of little trees that are next to each other. And then at the extended zone, 30 to 100 feet. The same basic principles apply. Maintain the outbuildings to the same standards as you would for just a regular build for a building. Um, and then we also recommend uh, six foot spacing between the trees. And that can be helpful just to ensure that you don't get tree to tree ignition and you don't get crown fire, which can carry fire pretty aggressively. And it's very, very difficult for firefighters to fight. So this is a good example. You know, here we've got before the mitigation work, we've got all these ladder fuels. We've got a lot of grass on the ground that can carry fuel or excuse me, that can carry fire, got a lot of fuel. Fire could travel along the ground, it could creep along the ground, it could get into um, this ladder fuel up into the tree, we get ground fire, not good, difficult to fight, difficult to suppress. Um, so what they've done is they've gone through, they've cleared some of the smaller trees out, they've cleared all of the ladder fields and all of the kind of intermediate vegetation, and we've created a condition where we can get low intensity fire along the ground, which is really kind of what we're after. So a good uh, case study, a good, a good way to kind of look at this um, is, uh, is the Marshall Fire. Uh, the Marshall Fire occurred in 2020, in December of 2020, between Christmas and New Year's, if you'll believe that, not normally what we would think of as uh, fire season. Um, and it occurred in an unincorporated area and in some incorporated areas of Boulder County, Colorado, um, which is uh, 50 miles south of where I grew up. Uh, it's in the foothills of the Colorado Rockies, made up of flat top mesas and open grasslands and creek bottoms lined with cottonwoods. Very, very similar uh, topography to some areas that we have in Wasco County. Um, and then uh, the area that was affected by the fire was a lot of scattered homes and small ranches, um, kind of intermixed with established neighborhoods. And then there were newer subdivisions that were had either just been built or were being built and were planted with shrubs and ornamental hardwoods. Um, so essentially like not native vegetation. Um, and then in between all these neighborhoods, they had open space and trails um, with unmanaged vegetation. And then um, on all this open space, they had three to four foot tall grasses from a very, very wet spring, not unlike the year that we had last year. And then all of those grasses, they got all of that rain in the spring and then they didn't get hardly any precipitation in the second half of the year. So including snow. So you had all of this well, three to four foot tall grasses from a wet spring. All of that fuel has cured out um, and has not yet been packed down by snow. So it's ideal for carrying fire. Um, it began as a wildland fire. There was a, um, a wildland ignition. And then um, to top it all off, they experienced wind gusts of over 150 miles an hour, which is um, more than you would normally see in a, in, a, uh, in a hurricane. So that moved the fire very, very quickly, which is part of the reason why they um, experienced two fatalities. Uh, suppression efforts were um, absolutely heroic. We had, uh, they had just over 6,000 acres burned. Um, but over a thousand acres, uh, excuse me, over a thousand structures lost, 1,056 structures lost. That included a Home Depot. I mean, if there is a single example of what we would normally think of as somewhere that has defensible space, it's a Home Depot. It's basically a concrete block, a concrete brick and box with asphalt around it. Um, and they still lost the Home Depot. And that was 
because of ember intrusion into, uh, into the ventilation system. Ember intrusion and burning material came in through the ventilation system. It um, ignited uh, the cotton filters and the, and the sort of soft and flammable material of the filters, and it burned down from the inside out. Um, and then they had a, an additional 164 structures damaged. So it was a wildland fire that became a structure fire. Um, and that's really where we can start to see this structure to structure ignition. Um, and uh, investigators were really able to see how the fire had moved into the community and then how it had how the fire had traveled through the community and destroyed structures. Okay. A couple lessons learned from the Marshall Fire. Uh, they saw a couple different fire pathways, um, but these two, I think, were the most significant and um, the, the most uh, uh, salient for this particular audience. Um, they essentially got a fire pathway of grass to fence. Um, there used to be a wooden fence here, and then uh, the wooden fence ignited. The wooden fence acted like a wick um, and carried. Oh, sorry, Jacob, can you hear me okay? I just saw your note in the chat. I can hear you fine. I'm just making sure that everybody else can. We had one participant that was was having issues with the sand. So I just want to make sure that we're coming across that and clear for most folks. So okay, great. Well, holler at me if I'm not coming through. Um, yeah, I, participants just let us know in the chat if you are having issues well. with hearing, but you're okay. coming across loud and clear for me. So you're doing great, Simone. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. All right. I shall continue. Um anyway, uh, as I was saying, one of the fire pathways that we got was grass defense. So we had grass fire. Uh pushed into the community by 115 hour mile gusts and additional wind. Um, then the grass fire transferred to the wooden fence, which was um, uh, just a pretty dense fuel for that fire to get into. Um, and then those wooden fence, that wooden fence essentially acted like a whip um, and carried that flame directly to the house because we had combustible material on the ground and enough flame to get up into the fence. The fence caught and carried the flame up to the house. And then uh, you can see here that flame impingement directly on the house. This is where the fence used to attach. Uh, and then um, they had the, uh, the fire impacted the fence uh, and flame was able to get into, uh, into the attic through the soffits and the vents. Um, and then they lose the entire structure. Another key takeaway is um, ensuring, you know, that we're controlling this flammable vegetation. Um, I don't think the Coca-Cola box was there uh, during the during the fire event, um, but essentially you have this, uh, what was probably at one point um, a green plant, uh, but because it's winter and it's dead, um, there, uh, it, you know, it's dropping leaves and it's dry. And so they have embers uh, land in the vegetation vegetation catches fire and then sheds embers and burning material and we get direct flame impingement uh, into the vents and then uh, we just and then again we lose the structure. This is another example of flammable vegetation. You know to my point um, about fire not being all consuming, you will notice that just in this photo, this they lost this structure, this structure uh, embers landed in this flammable piece of vegetation. This uh, tree clearly torched, uh, which means that it went up like a Roman candle. It torched up, ended up in the um, in the soffit and got into the attic, and that's how we lost the structure. But you'll notice that there is an unburned evergreen tree just around the corner of the house. So we know that that tells us that fire isn't all consuming. It's not going to devour everything in its path. It's just going to devour things in its path that are receptive um, for the most part. So essentially, we had this wind-driven fire. We had high urban and wildland fuel loads. We had grass. We had um, flammable, dead, dry vegetation up against structures. Structures themselves are a fuel type. Um, and then all of that combined together had major losses. So once again, that brings us back to our fire resilience transect. You know, we need to be thinking about all of this um, holistically. We need to be thinking about how do all of these different things intersect? What do we as individuals have control over? Um, and how can, we, uh, how can we adapt to it? We do not live in a reality where we can suppress um, and prevent all fire. Fire is, is part of us as humans. Every Everybody created a, a spark to, to, to be here today. You know, we've got electricity uh, running through the devices we're communicating through electricity. You created a spark when you turned on the ignition to drive to work today. You created a spark when you flipped on a light this morning. 
we live, we have to live with with fire. Um, it's part of us and it's part of how we how we function. And so we need to be able to also adapt to it and be prepared for it. Um, so that's why this transect is so important and why um, dealing with wildfire in our communities and adapting to wildfire in our communities is not just a single person's job. We have to do it together. Local governments have to be in on this. Partners need to be in on this. Um, everybody who's doing something that changes the face and the composition of our community needs to be thinking about fire and how we can all be more fire adapted together. But that's a tall order. Uh, you know, that's a lot. That's a lot of work. Uh, and it's going to take a significant amount of resources for us to get there because we're not there yet. Um, so what I will highlight is I will highlight some of our upcoming funding opportunities or, and some of the ones that have just closed. Our community uh, wildfire risk reduction grant from the Oregon State Fire Marshal just closed at the end of January. That offered financial assistance to local governments, fire districts, and non-governmental organizations uh, to build systems, essentially to increase community wildfire resilience, whether, resilience, whether it was additional education materials um, or uh, financing for a, a, green, a green dumpster um, or a community cleanup day. Um, you know, down to uh, ensure, you know, buying tools for people to do this work themselves or do it for their neighbors. Those decisions and those funding decisions will come in March of 2023. Um, and I'd love to share the numbers uh, and uh, to find out what the interest was in that once we have those. We are also planning uh, for launch this year, a defensible space public assistance grant. So that will be funds that come directly to members of impacted communities. Um, planning for that grant is currently underway. The idea is that the funding would be funneled to folks um, and they would be able to use it to do their defensible space work. That funding would come directly from the state of Oregon. Um, but uh, unfortunately, that's as much information as I have on the grant at the moment because we are still putting it together. And then, of course, there's always additional partners in, the, in, this, in this area, in this arena, um, interested in paying for work and interested in granting monies to do work. Uh, natural, uh, excuse me, Natural Resource Conservation Service is an excellent resource. They've received a significant amount of funding through the Inflation Reduction Act, which is now the Inflation Reduction Law. Um, and uh, the local NRCS office out of Wasco County um, is exceptionally uh, well versed in those funds and how they can bring those to bear on landowners um, and uh, in their various challenges. And then the Oregon Department of Forestry, uh, it's area dependent. Um, some offices put out grants at different times than other offices across the state, but I would highly recommend that folks reach out to the local office in the Dalles. There's a very, very talented group of people there um, with excellent uh, expertise that would be more than happy to answer questions and help out. Um, and if they don't have active grant funding, they can tell you when and where that would be available. Um, if you're interested and if you have a smart device, you're welcome to scan um, this little uh, QR code with a dinosaur in it. And that um, should take you to our website where you can sign up for additional grant updates if you're interested in um, being one of the first folks to hear when that uh, public assistance grant comes out. I'd be happy as well to drop that link in the chat. I'll drop my um, email and uh, the link to that um, information in the chat. With that, um, I think I'm uh, right at uh, right at time. Um, so I want to uh, take any questions that anybody might have. This is my cell phone number. You're more than welcome to reach out at any point if I can answer any questions for you. Um, and uh, my email address is right here as well. Um, uh, so yeah, I'll uh, I'll leave it at that. I'll stop sharing and um, drop my email in the chat. You'd be more than happy to take any questions if anybody's got them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simone. Um, well, other people may take a minute to think if they've got any questions. I had an interesting question with somebody that had uh, registered for this webinar. Um, they were uh, asking this question in regards to, you know, in the Dallas here, we had a couple of house fire, houseboat fires that happened at the marina. So they were asking, like, well, does this defensible space mandate apply to, you know, houseboat boat type situations? I was really kind of stumped on that question. Um, that's, uh, yeah, that's that gets a incorporated one. in that. Yeah, so um, gosh, I would imagine um, that it would be unlikely that uh, defensible space codes would apply to um, to a houseboat or a floating home. Uh, the reason being because there's no vegetation around around them. Um, there's fuel, right. but the in the form of other structures, but there's no vegetation around them. So 
uh, that would be um, that would be my my uh, my assumption on that front. Uh, now that doesn't necessarily they're not a, they they may very well be um, exempt from any uh, defensible space code, but they're not exempt from fire code. Uh, and so, seeing as that's a that's an area where somebody lives, works, and sleeps, they still need to have fire extinguishers and smoke alarms and all of that, everything that you have in yeah. your home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Tricky question. Yeah. Well, it's great. If people have questions for Simone in the future, uh, we definitely know how to get a hold of her. So yeah, uh, she's got her right. email uh, in the uh, link to the grant page there in the chat. If anybody wants to um, take a look at that now, feel free to click on that and get that now. And then if you're interested in receiving um, updates, you are, uh, the constant contact form is right there. I would highly encourage folks to just drop an email in there and you can be notified of any upcoming grant opportunities, including public assistance. All right, well, give me yeah, if there's like no more. That car in your picture. That's fabulous. All right, well, Simone, we greatly appreciate your time this afternoon. Um, with that, we'll transfer over to uh, Rick Fletcher, who is the Oregon Department of Forestry uh, Rangeland Protection Specialist based out of the Dallas here. Um, so, Rick, I believe I made you a co host so that you can share your screen whenever you get a chance. Sounds good. Are you guys able to hear me? You're coming across loud and clear to me, Rick. It sounds okay. great. Awesome. Well, I will go ahead and start sharing the screen. While I'm doing that, um, you know, I see a couple of familiar names in the, the group there, but uh, a few that I don't recognize. And Jacob had asked that um, <clears throat> maybe we talk a little bit about kind of suppression tactics. And I just want to make sure that, um, you know, folks in this group are um, are interested in hearing about that. If not, we can kind of roll into some other stuff, but I, I'm happy to kind of go into um, some of that. There, I know some of the folks that are in this may have been at our, our recent training in the Dells as well. So we'll give that a second. Uh, and if there's um, nothing from folks and I can go into the unit too, that's fine. Rick, do you maybe want to take a second just to explain the RFPA program? and how it's expanded in Wasco County. Just there's a lot of folks in this uh, program that aren't as tied into that. Yeah, sure thing. Um, so the, the Rangeland Fire Protection Program um, is kind of under the Oregon Department of Forestry as a way to help um, form groups or, or nonprofit associations to, um, to protect lands that don't uh, necessarily have a timber associated with them. Uh, you know, you might have some juniper and that kind of stuff. Uh, but th but things that don't have protection based under um, based on the timber value, and so uh, they came to be in 1964, I believe was the first one was Ironside, and the intent with that was to kind of protect or find a way for landowners to protect, uh, you know, their grazing allotments and that kind of stuff, and that's morphed uh, very recently, anyways, and and really developed into a pretty big program. Uh, now covering about 18 million acres, just under 18 million acres of um, of lands in Oregon, entirely with uh, volunteer associations. These are um, individual nonprofit organizations that kind of self-govern themselves and that kind of thing. And they, they get assistance from the Oregon Department of Forestry in many different ways. So um, they sign agreements with the state forester and the board of forestry. And those agreements allow us to help provide uh, surplus equipment, so surplus firefighting equipment that uh, retires out of the Forest Service or BLM, um, they would have access to that kind of stuff. Uh, surplus military vehicles, uh, dozers, uh, graders, low boys, that kind of stuff. Uh, it also allows us to help kind of provide assistance through um, getting agreements put in place with surrounding uh, federal agencies, state agencies, rural agencies, that kind of stuff. Uh, to make sure that there's mutual aid happening across because we, we we know that most of our fires are going to impact more than just one or two landowners especially up in the gorge there just the way the wind impacts things um, and that that program continues to expand so we've just formed uh, the petersburg rangeland fire protection association up in wasco county uh, they they currently encompass the same boundary of um, the Columbia Rural Fire District that had been established there previously. I know a few folks in here that uh, uh, have participated in that and, and now participate in the current RFPA. 
Um, they had tried to do stuff like that in the past, form an RFPA rather than the uh, special district. But uh, in Oregon, up until 2021, uh, Oregon law didn't allow croplands to be included in the definition of rangeland. And with the passage of Senate Bill 590 in the 2021 legislative session, that changed. And, and some folks uh, in the Petersburg area um, actually helped uh, testify to some of that and helped get that passed. So um, now that that's the case, Senate Bill 590, the intent was swapping that um, was to express an understanding from the legislative side of things that fire impacts lands regardless of their, their range or their crop or their timbered or their neighborhoods. And so uh, this allows a mechanism for areas, uh, particularly up in the wheat country, um, but other cropped areas as well that um, hadn't had an opportunity to form RFPAs and didn't quite meet the definition or um, wouldn't have met the need or had the ability to have a, a rural fire district formed in their areas. Um, to now have that ability. So that's kind of what uh, we're doing with that. Um, are there any questions specific to kind of what the RFPAs are or, or what our program is? All right, well, with that, I'll uh, jump into um, uh, suppression side of things. So if uh, if you guys have any questions, put them up in the chat or, or do a raise hand or something like that so I can, um, stop and, and answer any of those. So uh, I'm pulling some of this from our um, uh, basic fire class. So part of the services that we provide uh, as the Oregon Department of Forestry to the Rangeland Fire Protection Associations is um, we do a, a basic level fire class that is, um, you know, meets some federal needs to, to, to meet agreements with the BLM and the, the Forest Service. Uh, but doesn't quite meet, um, go into the extent that um, a lot of the um, you know, folks that are doing this professionally or, or on contract side of things, um, it doesn't go into the depth that they would necessarily go to. And, and, and we did that specifically so that we we are trying to cater these trainings to folks that are, are going to be out here as as landowners that have, uh, you know, either day jobs or their day jobs are to, to, to make money off the land, um, to raise cattle, have crops, that kind of thing, who are participating in this, uh, and not folks that are going to be uh, um, you know, traveling all over the country, uh, going on these large campaign events and that kind of thing. So we've cut a lot of material out of what the um, the national kind of standard uh, classes uh, bring into play because they have to cater to, to a, you know, a national baseline and really focused it in to uh, to be pertinent to the, the eastern, well, eastern two thirds of, of Oregon, if we'll say. So uh, this is part of that program. Uh, th uh, just a, a quick introduction into the suppression tactics that are commonly used in the desert and in the wheat country and some of the ways that we do those. And then at the end of that, I'll show you kind of how that really becomes really successful, um, comes into a, more on the accountability and kind of having some structure to, to how we're communicating things and coming up with the plan. So uh, we'll come into here. We're going to define methods of attack. So um, if you've ever been on fires, you've probably recognized most of these things um, and, and either done it and never put a name to it, or you've done it and you put a name to it and, you know, you're, you're checking the box by kind of watching me talk about it. But yeah, I, I do very strongly encourage any questions or anything like that that pop up. Uh, let me know. So the first uh, method of attack that we 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 try to do a really good job of is is direct attack. And so this is building control line that's directly on the fire perimeter or directly adjacent. Sometimes adjacent can means that uh, you know we have to pull away thirty or forty feet because the fire intensity is too hot or the the ground that we're working maybe there's something in the way or that'll allow time for the the fire to kind of we'll get ahead of it with our line and let the fire burn into it, but it'll hold. But ultimately it's it's direct. And the intent with this is to minimize the number of acres that are burned and stop it at, at its smallest footprint as much as we can. Uh, it's nice for uh, kind of maintaining situational awareness because you see exactly what's happening. You you see the fire behavior, what the fuels are that it's burning in, how those are burning and what's up ahead and how you can kind of start thinking about what your method of attack is gonna do, gonna be as that fire progresses or as your line progresses. Um, it can create really irregular fire lines. So, um, you know, in, in the wheat country, uh, in, in the Columbia Basin, 
the winds are often our driving factor for fires that that we know about that we think about often because they get big really really quick and those are pushed heavily by wind um, and and when you pull back at a, a 30,000 foot level, you'll see nice straight kind of regular lines where the fire starts to kind of form a V as it gets wider, progressing away from its point of origin. Uh, but the reality is on the ground, it's getting influenced by different fuel types, you know, switching between fields, uh, sorry, switching between fields um, and their edges. There's terrain influences that um, kind of can, can, change how fire burns um, as it's progressing, but also influences what the weather is doing there um, that can change the shape of the fire. And so what looks from, from the sky like a really nice straight regular line, the reality is there's a lot of uh, undulations, ins and outs uh, and fingers and that kind of stuff that form. Uh, when we go direct, you'll often have those types of irregular lines because you're you're right on it and and you, you, we're not pulling out to where we can make a nice straight line most of the time in grass types and that stuff uh, that's totally appropriate and and not a big deal once you kind of put it out it's out uh, that works pretty well in weed as well uh, when you start getting into heavier fuels uh, things like sagebrush some of the juniper that kind of stuff um, that becomes a little bit more cumbersome when you go to uh, mop the fire up. So once we stop the progression of the fire, we want to make sure it stays put. And that means taking heat away from the line. And the more irregular your line is, the more line you're having to cover, the more distance you're having to cover in a straight line as the crow would fly, you know, nice, quick, easy in that same straight line that the crow would fly. If you have a lot of irregular undulations, um, you know, that's, that's that much more line you're having to drag uh, a knuckle in. Any questions so far on that? And we'll get into what that looks like with types of equipment and stuff. So uh, this is uh, this is actually, uh, this Hummer is um, one of many that we have in the RFPA system and they've built it into what we call a type six engine. And so it's got a higher capacity pump, about 200 gallons of water on it and a couple of different ways to discharge water. Uh, they're really, really great for um, areas that have difficult driving um, situations and places that folks don't wanna beat their own pickups at. In, beat their pickups at sorry sorry guys areas that you don't want to beat up your own personal pickups um you know they, they've got the, these humvees they're pretty capable almost too capable sometimes uh they, they uh they go into areas that maybe maybe aren't worth going in and, and attacking fire at but uh they're pretty impressive you can see uh, here in this picture uh, these guys are actually out in what we call the green so there, there's a little bit of danger associated with driving in the unburned area, they'd be safer if they were in this in this uh, black patch. Um, and we'll get into that here in a little bit. But overall, they've got plenty of pump capacity. They've got plenty of water, and it seems to be effective for what they're doing here. And you can see they're directly suppressing this flank right in here. And as they progress, they'll probably wrap it around up, up further. Um, there's a potential that they'll use a different type of attack, and we'll get into that when we talk about what we call parallel. Direct attack with equipment, um, you know, with dozers that'll be right up against the line, uh, that can be pretty quick. Other types of equipment that are really, really effective in the wheat would be, uh, you know, the the discs that most folks put out in their fields when they're when they're harvesting. Uh, the harvest season tends to be, you know, where where you're you're most likely to get your starts up in the wheat. Um, you know, lightning can come in and affect that, but most of the starts up there are human caused, um, and 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 very rarely is it intentional, uh, but with uh, with such engaged landowner groups and RPAs that are up in the area, um, there's a lot of people ready to respond quickly, and that could be with the equipment as well. Um, with the discs, uh, th you can put a pretty decent line in really, really fast with those, especially if it's in a field that's um, you know a harvestable field. When you get up to the fringes or you start climbing some of the flanks and you get into the rocks, uh, you guys know better than I I do, uh, but that'll that'll beat that disc up pretty quick. Um, and so you can get a pretty incomplete line if you're trying to to plan, um, you know, staying right up against the fire's edge to an area where you're not able to move that piece of equipment anymore, and you don't have another plan or a secondary plan to keep to keep going direct. Um, that's a lot of effort that may, may have may may have been wasted just because you can't you can't continue to anchor that line in. Um, the thing with the discs that I would recommend, uh, and you guys have seen it, is um, you know more than one pass through. One pass through does a decent job of kind of doing what we call checking it up or slowing the fire spread down. 
but it's not always enough of a line to to maintain the same footprint that you caught it in. And I've seen where disks are um, well outside of the line, you know, maybe 30, 40 feet and staying out and away from the, the actual flank and letting the fire consume into it. Uh, I've also seen where folks actually have part of their disk directly on the flank of the fire, and they're kind of tilling some of that the, the active flank down into the ground a little bit with them. That works. Um, both methods would be would be um, pretty effective, pretty quick, um, and are probably dependent on a couple of things. But you know, fire behavior would would be one of those big things. That would be a lot to do with standing wheat. You know, that's something that you're going to want to get out and away from, just because it's putting off so much heat. Um, if it's in stubble or harvested or or any of that, you know, you might be able to go directly over it. So. That's with equipment. I've also seen um, graders do a pretty good job too, but that that takes a really skilled operator, um, uh, and and those used to be pretty common, but they're 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 we're seeing fewer and fewer of them. We'll also do different types of attack with aircraft. In this case, uh, that's a fire boss, and it's actually directly it's dropping water directly onto the fire on the fire's edge, that kind of stuff. The water itself, um, it can be just water. It might have some foam in it, which um, disperses the surface tension of the water and lets it soak in a, a lot better. Um, this is directly suppressing fire. So this is a direct attack with aircraft. When you see larger air tankers and that kind of stuff, um, putting out retardant, uh, which would be that red mud that's coming out of some of these planes, um, that's more likely gonna be um, a little indirect that is meant to slow the fire down and get resources in and take care of it, but it's not actually suppressing fire. The difference here is you're putting out a suppressant. It's not always just water. There's there's some other suppressants out there, but it's the most effective in our area. We're, we're really lucky to have um, you know the Columbia River right there and, and have um, aircraft that has the ability to fly uh, not only scoop from that, but also fly up and over the um, urban areas while they're loaded and over interstates while they're loaded. If you see buckets hanging underneath helicopters, that, there's some pretty strict constraints with allowing those things to do that. And so as a fire manager in the area, it was really frustrating to have fires on the south side of the freeway and not have the ability to use the Columbia River as a dipping uh, dip point. So um, you may have seen some of those dip from some of your ponds potentially as well for, for those who are viewing. So the opposite of direct attack is going to be indirect attack. This is where we're pulling a good distance away. This is more than just that 30 or 40 feet. This is where we're going out to, you know, that quarter, half or several miles out and away from the fire um, to, to places that we have an opportunity to, to, to do a, usually some sort of a firing operation and uh, get ahead of a fire before it gets there. Um, it's often due to a fire that's moving too rapidly or showing fire behavior that is um, not controllable when you're right up directly on it. And it's not necessarily independent from direct attack happening at the same time. There's a lot of times where we'll have folks at the heel or the back of a fire going direct and they're, they're working the flanks out to say a road system or a ridge system or areas that we've put in line. And at the same time, they're having to get way ahead of that, um, recognizing they're not going to catch the head. They're not going to be able to do a frontal assault on a fire, and they'll start cleaning up the head. So they'll do firing operations like this in areas of, of good opportunity and allow that fire to either um, run into a nice, big, thick black line, so it's not um, not likely to continue to jump that, or allow that backfire operation to kind of suck all the way back into the main body of the fire and eliminate any intense fire, uh, any, any intense fire right up against the line where you'd be worried about it jumping. The hard part with this is you're going to you're going to burn more acres this way. And uh, for the folks that are, uh, you know, making making a living off the land, that can be a really difficult decision to make um, because it's your livelihoods. And we totally understand that. Um, I think the last probably well, probably eight years or so, um, there's more and more recognition that uh, sometimes these just get too big and too intense and move too fast to be able to be directly up on them all the time. Uh, but we're certainly, that's going to be most of the time our go-to. Um, and so this indirect attack is becoming more and more, po um, not popular, but more and more commonly used uh, in our area just, just by proxy of the, the types of fires that we're having to fight. 
Um, you might get more acres burned, but you'll have typically have a more regularly shaped line, which is kind of nice. Again, for those times when you got to go back and, and, and make sure that it's held. Um, and, and also, you know, when you're using aircraft and that kind of stuff, um, they're very mobile and, and it's impressive what they can fly on, but they're most effective in straight lines as well. And so this is, this is where you have that opportunity to make those straight, more regular lines and, and get out to places where you have real opportunity to catch them. Um, it's also, again, a really heavily coordinated effort almost all the time. Um, I've, I've had a couple experiences where they're uh, maybe less coordinated than I would prefer, uh, but they were really, really effective and they were still coordinated. When, when you think about the, the, the big picture of things, they were still a coordinated effort um, done by folks with more experience than, than, than myself. And so their level of comfort, my level of comfort were different until it worked. And now, now I have that, that experience as, as a lens for moving into the future. So this video here is, is going to be in the timber type. But uh, just to kind of show a little bit of what that coordinated effort is, um, you'll see the trees have been limbed up. There's a decent line that's holding um, where they're at. There's people in place to make sure it's not going to jump the line. And if you really pay attention to what the fire is doing, it's actually sucking in towards the main body of the fire away from the line. And you might also notice, you know, the, this particular burn happens to be at night. You know, when we're doing these things, most of the time we're trying to um, to coordinate those efforts. Sorry about this case. We are trying to coordinate these efforts where um, everything can kind of line up to be successful. Um, there are times where you kind of have to just try something, but most of the time, we want the right weather conditions. We want the right type of line so that we're we have the the greatest chance of success. Because catching a fire um, is incredibly important. Catching a fire and not losing that fire is even more important. So um, those efforts again are, are heavily coordinated. Kind of a combination of indirect and direct attack would be what we call parallel attack. Um, this happens for let's see we got something in the chat. This happens for several different reasons. Uh, looking in the chat here, this indirect method allow for more flexibility to pivot containment strategy? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, indirect attack can allow for more uh, flexibility, um, mostly because you can you're 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 taking your box from this big and making it this big, and and inherently you're going to have different types of ridges, other roadways, that kind of stuff that you can kind of connect the dots on, and and then you can kind of set your um, your, your most optimal is going to be the smallest acreage. You might have a secondary opportunity that's further out and then a tertiary opportunity that's even further out. So in that case, yes. Um, I will say when we go indirect like that, um, because it's um, a, a, a pretty coordinated thing, it, it is that bigger box. There's a lot more thought and process that goes into it. And so that plan usually ends up being the primary plan um, with kind of your initial burn area, uh, the planned burn area, and we'll pivot less once that kind of gets into motion and it looks like it's going to be successful. We're a lot more dynamic and flexible when we're going direct and um, in the first few hours of trying to catch something. Um, there are indirect methods that happen during what we call initial attack, um, but a lot of the times um, we're doing indirect methods because we're getting outside of that that kind of uh, initial attack time frame and the impact of that's going to be larger if we don't do these things. And so we'll plan out a couple of days out ahead, most of the time with indirect. That's not always the case. We do, again, I will say we do use that, especially up in um, the Columbia Basin. We use indirect at attack methods during initial attack because of the wind, because of the dry fuels. And um, there's really no fuel breaks. If you, if you kind of look at um, wheat fields next to, you know, standing bunch grass or um, teat grass and sage and that kind of stuff we don't really have those opportunities on the landscape anymore and so we have to get out ahead of them um, the the wind has a big impact on that structures can have a big impact on that as well so um, you know it's a really good question does that help kind of answer that and if if the answer is no just that's okay tell me and i can i'll rephrase as well
I'll keep an eye on the chat just in case I didn't answer that for you, um, but I'm going to continue moving on here. All right. Um, so again, parallel attack is going to be OK. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, parallel attack um, is probably um, very commonly used for folks that have been on fires before. Uh, this is something where we'll be um, some distance away from the fire. You can see this is um, a little ways away from the fire. Um, we do this for a few different reasons. Um, a lot of the times it's based on the, the, the intensity of the flank that you're trying to work on on the fire and um, the number of resources that you have to kind of catch that. So in this case, in this picture here, he's going a little bit indirect, coming down, um, trying to stay out of as much of the heavy fuels as he can, um, but giving get, he's some distance away. And this is allowing him to kind of provide the straightest possible lines. By the time this fire burns up against his line, he'll have already anchored in somewhere. And then in this specific case, I had resources bringing hose and setting up a pretty big water show that were actually laying that hose in right behind them. So they were they were getting ready to hold this slightly indirect line. Um, in the wheat, uh, a lot of the times uh, you'll see, we'll, we'll build lines that are kind of uh, away from the fire, the flank of the fire because it's it's, you know, it's burning too intense or it's in an area that we can't draw, like get equipment and that kind of stuff in, we'll pull away from that and, and you'll see folks actually drag a little bit of fire in between. Um, that that low intensity firing right off the line is, is really just softening the blow that that flank may have when it impacts that line itself. And so we call that bringing the black with us. It's the safest way to hold a line and also keeps us nearest uh, the safest points for us to, to kind of get back into if, something were to blow across our line ahead of us or wind conditions were to change, we would have a burned area that we could get all of our resources back into. And we're bringing that with us. We're not, we're not having to um, continue to grow the distance between our safety zone and where we're actually fighting fire when we bring that fire with us, that kind of stays close. And so that's pretty common in the wheat country as well. You can do that with a burning operation. Sometimes um, just, getting a nice big wide line in a lot of this, especially on the flanks when the wind is kind of pushing um, from, uh, commonly during the summer, you know, that, that wind is pushing out of the west to the east and, and maybe even a little bit to the southeast. On your north and south flanks, your right and left flanks, um, they're not necessarily going to have these major wind shifts that blow out your line. And so sometimes you can put a decent line in and allow the fire to kind of consume its way out slowly and until it hits those lines and it'll put itself out. Um, this allows us to get, again, more, more regular lines, but it does uh, burn more acres than maybe direct would be. And as I said earlier, it's very rare that we're only doing one type of attack, um, especially uh, in, in on the windy days, it's, it's a mix. Um, on those real hot, stubborn days where there isn't the wind, and, and the, the atmosphere is pretty stable. You can still get starts uh, during your harvest, um, but your fire you'll notice is fairly well suppressed. And so it'll, it won't get nearly as large and it will kind of burn in more of an actual circle. Direct attack on that all the way around it is usually appropriate, but on days where you have wind um, or, or the wind and the terrain kind of aligned together, we're usually doing a combination of all three of these things. Again, um, I talked a little bit about burning. Passive uh, would just be letting that fire consume till it hits the line and puts itself out. And you need to make sure it holds. And so whatever it takes to kind of secure that is, is important to do prior to that. And then kind of direct, that would be actively burning. Um, you know, say we're putting this line in and, and that was actually the case on this. We, this is a Miller Road fire uh, out of Juniper Flats this last summer. A large line that started out as disc line got too rocky, well, followed it up with a dozer, um, and uh, it was a pretty significant effort by landowners and then uh, a couple agency folks, but mostly landowners and, and eventually a crew from uh, Clackamas County that came in and, and, and burned 4.1 miles of line. That was almost entirely uh, parallel attack with the exception of where it was at at the head. That would have been indirect attack. It was a ways away, let it burn back into itself. It was it wasn't the most ideal place when you think about the wind pushing right up against you when you're doing that. Um, but as uh, the, the foot person that was leading that burn told me, we're guaranteed to not catch it if we don't try. 
and he, he wasn't wrong um, at the when he was doing this i was looking at far more indirect methods to try to keep it from uh, going into Ty valley on day two so we use all sorts of control lines you know we talked about disk lines um we've talked a little bit about dozer lines this is that uh, retardant that comes out of um, the large air tankers. Again, you can put that pretty close or right on uh, the fire's edge, but it's not meant to do, it's not meant to suppress things in most fuel types. It may suppress a fire or let a fire burn out in wheat or grass types because they don't hold, um, uh, they don't have as much residual heat to kind of carry through that retardant line. And uh, there isn't a whole lot of, um, uh, the trees and that kind of stuff. So the aircraft is actually able to get a pretty low uh, flight in and get really good consistent coverage. So um, retardant works really well in most of the wheat country until you start getting in near the rivers and then those lines kind of break apart because we can't put that stuff into, into, into the river. You can have wet line. So this might be an area where you directly suppressed fire off of your truck um, and, and that worked out pretty good. We will have wet line as well when we're when we're doing some of those parallel or indirect actions in in grass, you can do really, really um, effective wet line by spraying underneath the dual or the rear tire like uh, he's doing in that picture here. What that does is um, as the tire as tires kind of go or as you spray water, you're really only getting the upper surface or one side of uh, the grass or the wheat. Um, is actually getting that moisture and there's a shadow on the other side, especially if it lays over and you have dry material underneath. And when you're putting it underneath the dual, you're allowing that tire to kind of drive that water down in deeper. It does a really good job of that. It also does a really good job of um, giving you a nice, easy line to keep an eye on, making sure that you, what you've caught, you haven't lost again. And it does that um, because your rear tire doesn't turn and undulate crazy um, as fast as maybe a front tire would or as uneven as somebody who's walking with the hose line or sitting on the back of the truck and bouncing around, you'll get a rear really irregular line. And so when you look back on that line, it's hard to tell if you've if if the fire is still in that that same footprint that you left it in. Um, when you can uh, do wet line this way, it works great. It's not necessarily something that I would do during direct attack. I would be directly suppressing flames if I was doing direct attack. But if I was doing any kind of uh, parallel or indirect attack where I was planning on using wet line to hold it, um, I would almost exclusively spray underneath the duels and I would have somebody with a, some sort of firing device right off the bumper of that, that vehicle. And I'd have a couple others in behind to make sure that we're holding it. Um, and, and have extra bodies there to, to catch it just in case that that doesn't work. So, you know, we use roads and that kind of stuff. This is an example of some hand line that did a pretty decent job. There's all sorts of types of control lines, um, you know, rivers, creek beds, draws, that kind of stuff can also help. Um, already burned areas do a good job. Um, we use that a lot in uh, 2018. We had substation, South Valley, Lone Pine, Boxcar. Um, after one fire had burned, the goal, uh, just because of how those were burning, was to try to, you know, obviously stop them as, as quickly as you can. Uh, but ultimately, we ended up having to steer fires into already burned areas um, because that was the only control line that was working at the time. So do I have any questions in the moment? I'm looking here. Nothing. Okay. So that's kind of that. Um, so this is a, a great example with the engines or your pump trucks or anything like that where you're spraying water. Um, you know, I mentioned being in the black is probably the safest place to be, and we'll get into that in, in this picture. Again, they're in the green, um, but you can see the smoke is kind of pulling into the black, so their visibility is a little bit better. They're directly suppressing the fire's edge as they're walking here, and this person's making sure that they're taking out any other residual heat, um, but they're the, the, the person in front's doing the majority of the actual suppression side, and this person here is kind of checking it up. That's going to maximize the amount of water um, or the amount of ground that you can cover and spray and put fire out um, and still maintaining some form of uh, kind of line security. If they had any issues, they would still have an opportunity to likely drive into the black, especially on a flank like this. They could drive right over those flames if they had to, um, or they could back up just a little bit, drive into the black 
if their vehicle breaks down, the fire changes conditions, that kind of stuff, they'll be in a safe place. This is a picture on, uh, I believe, substation. That engine's driving in the black. You can see where they drove is a nice regular line where they suppressed. It's a little bit more irregular, but really common in the grass, um, pretty appropriate tactics. And they're going, oops, sorry. They're starting to transition from what was a flank where you're gonna see a little bit lower intensity and starting to come around the shoulder into what we call the head of the fire. That's the, the kind of the flaming front. And that's where you're gonna see the most intense activity, the most intense heat, that kind of thing. So um, you can see here, if they were to have a breakdown or anything like that, they'd be in a perfectly safe place to just leave the vehicle. They're not gonna get hurt. They're not gonna burn anything over. It might be smoky and uncomfortable for a bit, but in this particular incident, that was that was an appropriate place for them to be. Had they been out in here and had a breakdown while trying to suppress from the, the fuel side into the black and they had a breakdown, that would be a very different story. Some other good reasons when, uh, that I really just want to promote driving in the black as much as you can is you'll avoid getting pinned up against all sorts of things. So um, once the especially in the wheat country as the fires burn through you you have a good understanding of where those ditches are and those draws that you may not have seen when the grass is high and tall especially in standing wheat you'll see those fence lines that you didn't know were there because they're the same height as the grass and you won't get pinned up against them limiting your ability to get back um, into the black if you needed to you'll also avoid all sorts of different stuff um, in 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 the classic you know i i, I love the area that that we live because of the history that's out there. But the history also means there's really cool antique implements and that kind of stuff um, from, from our pioneer days and early farming days that can really do a lot of damage to a vehicle if you were to drive through this grass as it's burning from the green side. You would have never seen some of these plywood, some of the rocks. You might have seen the top of this, maybe. Um, I've had several incidents where, um, you know, folks have, have tried to come in uh, through the green and done damage to vehicles. I, on South Valley, we had um, about, oh, like $7,000 worth of damage, uh, one to a to an engine that uh, didn't see a ditch because all the grass was the same level. And another one that uh, ended up getting stuck with a, a metal fence post through the driver's rear uh, wheel well. And he actually got stuck on there with fire coming towards him. So... Those mistakes happen, um, but they're they're preventable when we we try to get into the black. So these are different types of attack um, to to accomplish um, you know, more direct attack methods. These are these are these are what you guys are likely already doing and coordinating on the ground. They they have names, and 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 I wouldn't necessarily say when I brief my folks that are coming in to suppress fire. I don't necessarily say, hey, let's do a pincer attack. I, I ask them to take one flank and I'll take another flank and we talk about where we'll meet in. That's what a pincer attack is, but the communication sounds different. So again, each engine is going to take a separate flank. They're anchoring in off the road. So an anchor point, that's a safe place that's not going to burn, um, reburn or burn. And it's a place that if, if any th conditions were to change uh, while suppressing fire up in here, it's a place that you can always come back to and and re-pick up that 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 firefight again. Um, it's a safe place to continue to go back for your safety, but also to again, if things change, you can reassess your attack on there. Both of them anchored in off of a road, and they're doing what we call anchor, flank, and pinch. I use that method on every single fire that I fight. They started at the heel of the fire and progressed up the flanks towards the head. Um, that's going to be your safest method. If you did that every day, you'll 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 be in the safer, or you'll you'll be really effective as a firefighter. But you'll also you know kind of be in a safe place. That doesn't necessarily mean that we don't um, at times go towards the head of a fire first. Um, but when we do that, there's there's a few parameters that I have in place when I make those decisions. The first is what types of resources do I have directly behind me, and the second being, what am I stopping uh, by going directly to the head? Most of the time, it's a house. It's the $500,000 tractor that's out there. Um, it's 
uh, a pocket of fuel that if the fire gets into it, we'll be in this for more than just a couple hours. We'll be into it for several days or weeks with hundreds of people. So um, th those are the decisions that I kind of look at. The biggest thing is when I go to the head of a fire, I'm coming into the black and I might make an attack there, but I have a coordinated effort, whether it's other vehicles that are coming in that are gonna take on the flanks, or I'll hit the head of the fire and it's small enough, I can get back and I'll flank the fire and come back around from an anchor point. And all I'm doing is checking the head up, stopping it for a second and then re-anchoring. If all I did was come and take out the head of the fire and I did nothing with the flanks, I'm gonna have one fire that had one head of uh, one head to chase. And I'll go from that to having a fire that has two different heads to, to, to chase because I didn't take care of those flanks. So a really um, the most common what we kind of see is what we call tandem attack. And this is where you have several different vehicles um, in a line together. The front vehicle is doing most of the actual suppression work. The vehicle behind the front is um, kind of checking things up. Again, kind of building some depth where you're taking heat away from the line, the actual, the, the, the suppressed line and, and, and taking heat toward more interior. So you're creating a, a, a bigger swath that's um, gonna be less of a threat, something that's gonna hold as a control line. And the third vehicle is there to pick up anything that, that uh, slops out of there. And then as they progress, should that front engine run out of water, you've got two more to come in behind it and you're still continuing progress. Uh, you'll notice that they're all on the same flank, uh, this case, they took the the kind of lesser of the two flanks that were uh, as far as intensity goes, and that that's totally fine. Others might go to the more intense flank um, just to 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 stop that from being issues. Neither answer is wrong there, but they're anchoring, they're flanking, and they're pinching off the head. This is kind of an example of uh, another version of tandem attack. So in this case, this engine was first; they were suppressing. These guys communicated with each other, and he decided to leapfrog this engine into an area where he knew that engine was going to make it to it, and he started spraying back in here. What you'll see is both of them are in the green, and this is where the red truck had started spraying. Right in behind him, you can see he didn't quite catch whatever was back in there, and so now he's going to have to pull out. He could go straight into the black, and that would be safest but he has no fence lines or no major ditches or anything around him. Um, and he, he can, if he needs to, loop back in the green as well. Um, but they're gonna have to pick that line back up again, so. This is that same fire. This vehicle actually went straight to the head and uh, did a, a, a pretty good attack on it before it got to um, some actual bailed areas. But you can see they're not likely going to have a surprise ditch come up on them or a big rock or a piece of equipment that was um, you know hidden by grass and that kind of thing and should they have any mechanical issues or the fire change conditions they're in an area that they'll be able to stay safe in they can always circle back and pick it up again and this is a picture of that same fire that same flaming front uh, from the green looking in so um, you know, the, the, the intensity of heat that the person on the nozzle is going to take, um, the intensity of the heat that the vehicle may take is going to be less most of the time coming from the black, just because you're not in, in the path that the wind is blowing a lot of that convective and radiant heat towards. So most common that we use is what we call envelopment. And so this is where there's several different opportunities to develop anchor points. Most of the time it's related to something, a value at risk or um, you know, an easier access point that folks come into. Ultimately, all of these anchor points, any kind of fire suppression that happens with them is gonna have to be coordinated. And they're still taking out the flanks first and then they'll pinch the head off as well. So we'll do that. That, that is something that we do very, very commonly when there's, um, there's structures and that kind of stuff. We will put, we'll put vehicles up where the structures are. Uh, if we can anchor in right there, we will. Um, if we have to create an anchor point, we'll do that um, as a method to kind of steer the, the fire away from those structures. That me doesn't mean that we we have that we just leave the flanks unattended though. So you'll see that's a coordinated effort and, and often driven by the values that are out there.
This is another example of parallel attack. Um, one of the things I want to get um, a, a, a kind of a point across is in, in most cases, not in all cases, the, the amount of um, material that you might end up burning here if you were to cut these off is, isn't going to have a significant value to it. Um, it. It may in some cases, but not, not all cases. Um, and so if we were to directly attack this and come back in to clean it up, mop it up, we have a lot of line to cover versus cutting all these fingers off and making a nice straight line and then letting this stuff consume or burning it. Um, we have a much straighter line. It's under our control, uh, which means less work on the back end and a more regular line to kind of keep an eye on as the days progress. The other thing is anytime that you see these sharp V's or pinch points uh, in fires, they're, they're kind of problems because all of this fuel in between here, even if it didn't burn, it's been pre-treated. It's heated up, it's dried out, which means it's ready to go. And if we miss even just a little piece along these edges, that's a good likely, or there, there's a lot of potential for reignition in those, those kind of pinch points there, those sharper corners, that kind of thing. And so we try to avoid sharp corners as much as we can when we're, we're creating control lines. And parallel attack is a great way to do that. In this case, they're putting in a wet line or a hose lay, and then they're actually gonna have somebody burning right off of that line. And they're probably gonna have some folks that are in there holding that, right? We don't wanna play catch and release with this. So that leaves a nice straight line. Uh, this is the picture from earlier. Again, so they could directly attack and suppress this, come all the way up this draw and around. Uh, but what is the value associated here? There might be some grazing value associated with that. And in, in years that um, you know we don't have a good grass crop uh, and, and you're trying to feed cattle, every, every ton matters. Uh, but a lot of times it makes sense in this case to straighten this line out. So do a wet line and burn off of that. That saves you from having to, to cover a lot of ground with heavier fuels, right? You're in lighter fuels out here, heavier fuels here. The heavier the fuels, the more water it takes to suppress, the more time it's going to take to make sure that that gets mopped up and the more likely that it'll jump a line. These lighter fuels, they once they kind of burn, they're done. And so it takes a lot less water, a lot less effort. It gives you a good straight line to go back and check. And 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 you're you're less likely to have control issues after you've caught the fire in this case. So neither answer is wrong. Um, every situation is going to be different, but just another way to look at how they could attack that. And then indirect attack again, this is going to be some distance away. It's, it's almost never uh, the case where we only have resources at the head of a fire. Most of the time we'll have um, indirect plans going in, into play while we're doing more direct line or flanking the fire. So the, the graphic's not great at showing that, but they're going to an area of control line. So, you know, this could be dozer line on the edge here, the brown, um, and they're, they're taking it back and they're doing a coordinated burn just slowly progressing and kind of making that catcher's mitt for the head of that fire to kind of run into without busting out the, the roads or, or contr other control lines. So, and then there's stationary attack. You can do direct, parallel, or indirect with stationary. This is where we're setting up large hose lays and kind of bigger operations, a lot less common in our area, uh, with the exception of uh, once it kind of gets down into to certain draws and rivers, that kind of thing, we might have hose lays in place um, in, in areas that have heavier fuels that you can't get equipment to. Uh, this is very, very common in heavier fuel types. So that's when you get into more of the timbered grounds and that kind of stuff. Am I progressing okay, Jacob, as far as time goes? Yeah, I think you're doing uh, good, Rick. Probably have another 10, 15 minutes left. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to move kind of past some of the hose lay piece. Just it's uh, pretty, pretty uncommon. Not, not, not entirely uncommon. We use it a lot just to the west of, of, of the wheat country there. But, um, you know, when we're putting in hose lays, especially progressive hose lays like this, that hose is likely going to stay in place for a few days uh, because that water is necessary to mop up a fire. Um, so again, heavier fuel types, that kind of thing. 
uh, not necessarily drivable or or is going to be in place for long enough where using engines doesn't make sense. Again, really heavy fuel type here. Um, that slash is going to hold residual heat for a long time. It's going to take a significant amount of water to take the heat out of that and maintain this control line. So that's where you would see those things. Um, it's a little hard to do here, but I'd like everybody to kind of think on their own um, where they would consider beginning their attack on the fire that you see in the picture. And I'm just give that a second while you guys kind of think about it. And again, there's there's no wrong answers for the most part. Um, so on this fire, um, hopefully most of you aren't going up ahead of this, especially in the green. That would be what we call a frontal assault. Our hope is that you're coming in down here at the heel of the fire or near the point of origin and starting to progress line some sort of line. It could be equipment, it could be water, um, you know, whatever you think is appropriate for use here, and progressing up along those flanks until you pinch off the head of the fire. Um, hopefully that's what you guys have got out of this a bit. Um, this is going to be the lowest intensity, greatest chance of success for holding and controlling this line if you took the right flank. This is gonna be um, a flank that some may think about going towards first, just because it could be a bigger problem and they can get back to this one after they've suppressed some of this. Again, no answer is wrong there. As long as we're taking care of ourselves and our people and, and we're, we're, we're aggressively putting things out safely, we're gonna anchor in, we're gonna flank the fire and we're gonna pinch off the, to the head. The other side of this is um, you'll notice I'm, I'm talking about uh, the head and the heel and that kind of thing. We 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 typically don't talk about um, the flanks of fires or the sides of fires by coordinal directions. That works okay for aircraft, uh, but people can get turned around really really easy, um, especially really experienced people um, where they think they're on the east side of the fire, but they're actually on the south or the west. Um, and, and you'd be amazed at how many times that has caused um, a lot of trouble. And so what we do, um, try to have some uniform communication and ways that we label things across the country. So we're all speaking the same language and understand what we're, we're talking about um, is the heel or the point of origin is going to be near the rear of the fire. It's usually the least intense burning, especially during its initial burn period. Um, and and it kind of establishes the back. The head of the fire is going to be where you see the most intense burning, and that's the direction the fire is burning towards. So the heel is where it started from. The head is where it's going and towards most intense fire activity. And then the flanks, we try as much as we can to say right flank or left flank. Um, it works really good identifying the shape of those things when aircraft comes around. Uh, it helps provide a, a, a just a nice common um picture for everybody who's coming into that fire regardless of their level of experience with with um, suppression so um, really try to keep things simple there all right anchor plank and pinch so this is uh this is burning in slash so the the heat and the flame lengths are pretty impressive you know you're looking at 150 to 250 foot tall trees and look at the flame lengths that you're seeing there you're seeing a lot of what we call spot fires. And so that's an indication of pretty receptive fuel beds and uh, pretty intense fire behavior. Um, in this case, the hope is that you guys aren't necessarily going straight for that stuff. Um, in this case, you're probably, or we would hope that you're starting to kind of think about maybe a little more indirect in this case. Give yourself some time to get up on those landings and roads or ridges and build a plan. Going in here and suppressing with the hose lay on that initially isn't going to be enough. You're going to have to put some bigger control line in, and then you're not going to be able to stand safely right up against that stuff. It, it puts out a lot of heat, and so think about things a little bit more indirect there. There isn't any difference when we think about the basic method, though. We're still going to establish an anchor point or several and then work our flanks until we can get up and pinch the head of the fire off. So that anchor flank and pinch model is still very applicable here.
Okay, I think we'll uh, skip into some of this stuff here. Talk a little bit about some of the hazards to people. So we want you guys to go out there and do this safely. We want you to, to, to um, be effective in what you're doing, but the most important thing is that everybody comes home. And I'm sure many of you have had experiences that weren't, um, weren't very pleasant on fires. And there's, there's usually several um, in, influences that kind of impact that. Um, and I'd love if you guys have additional um, potential hazards for folks as I list these off. If you have other potential hazards, just put them in the chat, and I'd, I'll add them to the add them to the PowerPoint here. It's an ever growing list, so you know smoke is going to have a heavy impact on your visibility, um, and the way that you can breathe, and then yeah, there's you know chemical imbalance that starts to happen because you're you're taking in uh, either carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide, and our brains don't function as well when we're doing that. Visibility is low, could be to dust as well. Uh, terrain can get really difficult. Animals in duress, um, especially when you're working around homes. Um, domesticated pets are um, very, very, very unpredictable when you have fires near um, the near structures and that kind of stuff. Um, cattle and horses and those kinds of things, they they um they, they can certainly be under duress, but they they're a little bit more um kind of self-reliant and hardy. And so they're more predictable um, a lot of the times. Machinery, all sorts of stuff. Um, machinery itself can pose a hazard and its abilities and limitations, that kind of stuff. Uh, in, in a lot of cases, um, you might be getting folks that have zero experience working around machinery. And so they could be the hazard. Uh, you know, if you're working a, a dozer or a, a disc, um, you may have folks around you that don't recognize you don't. You're not looking over your shoulder every single time you go to make a turn because you're focused on the fire and they can't you can't hear them you're in a large high uh, seat that's that is, makes it difficult to see other things around you um a lot of a lot of mistakes happen around machinery uh, folks that are evacuating uh, they, they're uh, completely understandable under a lot of duress a lot of stress and 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 i i would hate to be in that situation and and i've asked folks to evacuate too many times to 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 not feel the weight of that, um, but you know it's necessary. So, um, but that but they can pose a lot of hazards when they're coming in or out to to you know gather their belongings and get them to a safe place. Aircraft pose a lot of specific um, uh, challenges, and and I strongly encourage anybody uh, if you're out fighting fire and you don't have a radio with you or aren't in communication with somebody who is speaking with the aircraft, if 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 those fire bosses or any other planes fly past you and they tilt their wings at you, they're trying to get your attention as they intend to drop where you're at. And they don't want to drop this stuff on top of you. It's incredibly dangerous to be under that. Those fire bosses, they look small. They carry 800 gallons of water at eight gallons or at eight pounds per gallon, roughly on average. When they drop low, they can crush cabs, blow windows out of cars. They can lift you off the ground and and throw you into things or throw things into you. So aircraft pose a lot of specific hazards that um, that we don't recognize. So a lot of folks have been dumped on and not had an issue. Don't be the person that gets dumped on and has an issue. Try to get out of their way. Intoxicated responders, intoxicated personnel. It's no different than trying to make good decisions when you've choked a lot of smoke, your brain's just not ready for it. Or if you're incredibly dehydrated, anything like that. We make very, very different decisions when we are intoxicated versus when we're in a good state of mind. In uh, in the kind of Petersburg area and that kind of stuff, there's actually um, you know a lot of agencies that will not respond or assist with fires out there because of the amount of drinking that may happen. Um, they they have every right to kind of pull their folks out because it can potentially pose a hazardous um, a hazard additional hazards to them. Uh, so. Just know that and, and try to try to, to think about those things as we're coming in to do this. Um, having a beer after everything is all done and you're back at the barn, no issue. But when we're on the incident, uh, really strongly discourage doing that. It's freelancing, so doing things not coordinated in the plan. And um, that can look like a lot of different things. Uh, most of the time uh, in our area, it looks a lot like folks that are directly suppressing fire and other folks that are going out to the road and burning it. Well, if you're burning between the uh, the road and the actual 
fire's edge, you're you're putting those folks in between fire, right? And that's that's not coordinated. That puts people in a bad spot. Um, so making sure that we're 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 doing some version of coordinated effort and and really com um, communicating with each other, maintaining accountability is going to be really important. Anybody that's amped up and excited, they're going to make different decisions than if they take a deep breath, take a step back, look at the picture as a whole, and then make a decision. And again, if you had any other hazards that you wanted to share, feel free to put those in the chat. So I'm gonna stop that piece and just kind of ramp back up. Um, for those who saw some of this this last year, um, we talked kind of about how we go about actually coordinating all of these efforts. And I, I just really wanna to touch um, real quickly on kind of the, the incident command system. I'm not saying that folks have to um, label themselves the same things that we do um, as agencies. But uh, grouping grouping together, uh, having singular points of contact and maintaining communication from the bottom to the top, whoever's making decisions and implementing things is incredibly important. And, and if you're in the RFPAs and you're using um, mutual aid from other agencies, they're going to be working under this system uh, because it establishes a common set of language. It establishes a common set of um, known responsibilities per role. It limits the number of people that have to be um, communicated to by those who are in leadership positions. And so it kind of streamlines communication and allows decisions to be made a little faster. Um, but it, it, it's, it's, it's nothing that you guys aren't already doing most of the time out, out in those areas. We just, we have names for them. Um, and, and so I just wanted to, to kind of talk a little bit about that. So, you know, ultimately the incident commander has all um, kind of there, they, they have all the decision making um, authority related to the suppression tactics that you're putting on that. Um, these guys, liaison officers, and that kind of stuff work directly for the incident commander, but on small incidents, you may not have those. This is completely scalable. Most of the time, you guys are working in this operations section, which we break down into a couple of other categories, mostly for uh, maintaining that accountability side of things. So um, if we're on a large piece of ground, we break out the ground into what we call divisions. We can also break out into functional areas. So when OSFM comes to assist with suppression of wildfires, they'll typically, not always, but typically come in as the structural group. And, and they function in protecting structures across all divisions, and they develop their own structure within, the, within that. Divisions are geographically based. They're taking on pieces of ground that make sense for one or two people to kind of help manage all the resources that are on that piece of ground. And then underneath that, you know, again, we can have several resources assigned to the same piece of ground. Um, and we, we, we break those out into to what they are, strike teams and task forces. Task forces are um, groups of uh, differing types of resources attacking a singular chunk of ground. And so that in this case here, you know, you've got the disc, you've got a large engine and several smaller engines, those guys banding together and suppressing this flank, that's going to be a task force. Having one point of contact for the leadership to be able to talk to whoever is kind of leading the charge for this group is incredibly important. Um, having, you know, a radio for everybody, everybody in the communications, um, listening and understanding all the communications is important. But you can get to where you're trying to manage hundreds and hundreds of uh, folks talking and having ideas and doing things, trying to limit that and have um, accountability through appropriate span of control is is very important. The other thing you'll see really common is is strike teams. And so this would be um, you know an example of they're all these are all similarly typed builds um, of vehicles or or the same type of um, size, scope, and scale that would be a strike team. The only difference between those uh, strike team and a task force is a task force is mixed resources. The strike team is the same or similar. So again, those all have one point of contact and, um, and, and they're maintaining accountability. Again, the biggest piece um, to anything that we're doing here is ma making sure everybody makes it home. Having some structured system where we're checking in with each other, we're getting a briefing, we're operating on one common plan. We're looking at the fire with the same kind of lens or a similar lens, 
and we all have the ability to kind of voice concerns, safety concerns, that kind of thing. That is how we do this effectively and safely together. Ultimately, I want everybody to be able to make it home. So that's kind of coming here. The other, the last piece to that is making sure you guys have some point of contact when you are going home. If you got to get home to feed the cows, got to get back to get some rest and come back at it the next day. We 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 put a lot of um, of emotion and effort into making sure everybody makes it home. And if folks aren't communicating that they've left, we have to assume the worst. So make sure that you you guys have some way of checking in with each other and reporting back. So. That's all I have for this. Um, if there's any questions related to suppression tactics or um, kind of uh, differing approaches to 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 suppressing fire, um, any of that kind of stuff, I'm very happy to to answer any questions. Well, Rick, just while people kind of think more about if they might have questions, um, I know this is kind of a diverse group that we have on here today that, you know, some people, not everybody necessarily has, you know, pumpers or trucks with water tanks. I mean, for a small landowner, you know, what are some good things for them to think about in terms of basic equipment that, that would be useful in like in terms of a small start while they wait for, you know, agencies to show up? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, initially... Um, having any kind of, you know, extinguishers, that kind of stuff immediately available to try to catch a fire when it's in that kind of incipient stage. So if it's uh, maybe attached to a piece of equipment or it's just now getting on the ground, if there's something you can do to keep it there uh, with that, that would be great. Um, you know, the shovel goes a long ways uh, and knowing how to use it. You could do a lot of good work with that and other types of hand tools. Bladder bags are a really, really big thing. Um, and they come in all sorts of, of different forms. If Even if you have, uh, say, Sojo backpack sprayers uh, for going out and kind of taking care of not weed that kind of thing in your fields uh, carrying something like that around with water in it um, gives you you know those three four or five gallons of water um, that you can pressurize and have a nozzle with to to spray those things out you know if it's getting beyond your your control with that or any equipment that you have to suppress getting out to an area where you can lead or point or direct any kind of incoming resources in is super, super important. Um, I, I don't know all the roads. I don't know the landowners. I'm gonna try to do my best uh, to get out there the right way. And, and so is everybody else, but having somebody that can flag those resources down and get them into where the fire is actually at or into those areas that you know you have better opportunity to catch it or to those water sources that we don't know about as as agencies, um, that would be kind of the last step. So the, the extinguishers, the shovels, and kind of hand tools, any kind of uh, um, mobile water, um, and, and that doesn't have to be the large 200 gallon tanks. It could be as small as a you know five gallon soda backpack pump with just water in it or um, an actual um, bladder bag that's the same concept um, would be kind of the next step. And then removing yourself a bit or or getting somebody down to to flag and and lead all sorts, especially the agency resources in, that goes a really, really long ways. And then the information that you have about your land is going to be incredibly important. Where the fences are, the draws that you can't drive in, um, where it makes most sense to access things, you know that land better than anybody else. And 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 having people come in to help fight that fire is is all great, fine and dandy, but it's going to be more efficient and more effective um, when they know where they can go to right off the bat. And you're going to know that and, and you're going to be the one helping make those decisions. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks for those considerations, Rick. And I I know in the, the registration, somebody had uh, made a comment about um, in the event that a fire evacuation happens and power is turned off, um, you know, what do you do for water supply? And so just, you know, for my experience to answer that question is really the best, the best backup system you can have is if you live in an area that's got some topographical lift that you can, you know, put, you know, a thousand gallon tank on the hillside behind your house, you know, gravity feed is the best um, way to really make that bomb proof in the event that you have no electricity, and you don't have a generator. Um, you know, obviously having a generator and a pump that can pump water or gas powered um, pump can go a long ways as well. Um, 
So, I mean, this individual is looking for suggestions for backup generators and, and backup systems. And so, like I said, you know, if you're, you have the ability to create a gravity fed system, that's going to be your best bet. Um, you know, I don't know if you have any suggestions, Rick, with what you see with landowners buying, you know, I know there are some pretty um, good, reliable Honda type water pump that can definitely move water in the event that you need, need water quickly. Yeah. Uh, we've also uh, kind of, this is going to sound goofy, but um We've actually seen a, a lot of improvements from some of the Harbor Freight brands as well. Um, the Predator pumps seem to be doing a pretty impressive job um, for half or a third of the, the price. And so for something that's going to be used intermittently like that, um, just like with any other carbureted motor, you know, there, there's got to be some upkeep. They got to be run. They've got to have some decent fuel in them. Um, but those are also options. The Hondas are great options. Um, and whether it's a pressure pump or a volume pump, anything that's going to flow water is a good idea. The, the challenge we see with some of that, um, and, and every, they have the absolute right to do so, is um, there are folks that'll hook up uh, sprinkler systems from their water source to a gas-powered pump, and, and they're, they're protecting their home and, and house. Uh, a lot of the times, it's pretty far out ahead of when that effort was kind of needed, and that water could have been used a different way. And so just thinking about those things as you leave, it's you're never going to harm any feelings by protecting your home in whatever matter you think is appropriate. Um, but but if if there's an opportunity to use that water for for actual suppression, um, especially in that that wheat country, that that would go a long ways. And and I like the idea of the gravity feed that that works really well um, for a lot of that kind of stuff. So if you have spray rigs and stuff that you can put in a safe place that are full of water and they're marked or 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 have some flagging to lead people in, that would be that would also be really helpful. All right. Well, I appreciate your time, Rick. Um, I'm going to be pulling up my slide here. And so if people have any other questions, you know, I'm just going to pause for a sec. Let us know in the chat if you got other questions. I think I saw Rick put his email in the chat too as well there. Awesome. Well, and just another shameless plug, if you guys haven't heard about or um, or maybe haven't participated in yet, uh, the stuff there in, in northern Wasco County, the, that Petersburg RFPA, they are doing a fantastic job of organizing, and um, it's going to really, really benefit uh, anybody in Wasco County, but specifically that 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 wheat country. Um, their coordinated efforts are, are pretty incredible and, and, and really like seeing where they're going. So if you haven't participated and, and you're in that area, um, please reach out. We'll get you in contact with them. They're, they're, they're certainly um, looking for more good folks. So. And I believe, Rick, you guys are playing. Uh, Rick just helped out with a training they did last week, but uh, you guys are playing having another training in June, I believe. Yeah, yeah, I think as uh, um, a lot of the kind of summer help and that kind of stuff comes in, we're going to do another class. And I think um, it sounds like the interest for that would be getting it done either over several early mornings or several evenings instead of doing um, our, our class typically takes about a day and a half um, and, and we're constantly refining it. But that day and a half seems to be kind of the happy place so um it could be over the span of three or four nights and 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 get that course to folks all righty well thank you so much for you guys' time i really appreciate it reach out with anything thanks thanks again rick greatly appreciate it so great wealth of information shared so hopefully it's not over everybody's head but um you know, regardless of, of what you end up doing, I think it's good if you're not, you know, at the point you're going to be actively putting your fire out. I think Rick did a good job kind of laying out kind of a better understanding of what, of what the agency folks are trying to do when they show up. So thanks again, Rick. Thank you. So just uh, to kind of pause here and, and look at again, where we're kind of at with this webinar. We're a little bit over halfway uh, through now. Um just the way things are going this afternoon. I mean, feel free if you got to get up, uh, take a potty break, uh, feel free to, but I think we're just going to keep powering through this. Um, and just uh, trying to look at my screen better here. Um, but so, you know, we're a little bit behind schedule here, but basically um, where we're going to go um, next, uh, different things for the agenda here. I do want to add to the agenda here as well. We had the in-person training uh, earlier this week, and we had a, a transmission line manager with uh, Bonneville Power Administration that came to talk about power line safety, uh, particularly during wildfires. So we're going to, I'm going to quickly cover a few points that, that he stated uh, during our training earlier on, on considerations for power line safety, you know, especially in our large uh, Bonneville Power Administration transmission lines. 
that run through a lot of the agricultural area here in, in North Central Oregon. Um, then we're going to kind of talk more about fuels in the agricultural landscape. And basically, I just hope to kind of build some context for Katie Wolstein's presentation that she's going to give after that on potential control locations. Uh, you know, the idea with these uh, PCLs is basically these are strategic areas um, that you can think about having on your particular property that, you know, if there was a fire start that was coming towards your area, towards your property or towards your structures, they've done basically some prep work ahead of time with potential fuel breaks or other fuel man management considerations that would make it so that first responders can, can better get in there and, and help save your infrastructure there when a fire happens. Uh, then after that, we're going to kind of conclude. I'm going to come back and talk a little bit about some vegetative fuel break research. I've been doing it some general fire research as well to kind of help help better inform some decisions we might make in terms of of different ways we can create PCLs on our property. So, um, so the, with that, we're going to first start talking about um, power line safety briefly here. Um, where did those slides go? Okay, hold on here. But so we have a lot of these uh, large transmission lines that go through uh, the northern part of Wasco and Sherman County and, you know, across the state. Uh, you know, these power lines definitely pose an electrical risk as well. Uh, but at our in-person training there, you know, Rick Fletcher really marked that a lot of the local starts that happen for power lines, they tend to primarily be from where we have transformers and on the smaller lines that are going, you know, towards your house and those type of, you know, smaller structures. Uh, you know, luckily, knock on wood, these large transmission lines usually don't result in any fire starts. Um, however, once we do have a wildfire burning underneath of these, it can really create some some hazardous situations. Um, so real quickly, this is a fire that was going on in Northern California. I think it, it was called the station fire it happened quite a while ago. But you can see basically we have a transmission line here that's that's rising quite a ways above. But you see the really uh, hot fire burning there below, really thick smoke. So we're going to play this video to show you what happens with that sick, thick smoke. So that smoke is so thick that the particulate matter in it is such that it can allow basically an arc to happen. Uh, it can cause an arc across the lines. It can also cause an arc down to uh, you where you're parked with your metal truck as well. So again, you can see the very thick smoke there. Uh, keep watching for it. Pretty soon here, we're going to see an arc. Oh, right there. I think it just arced. Yeah, it did. So obviously that's that's a pretty extreme fire that's going on there. And luckily they were fortunate the arc that happened uh, didn't really arc all the way down the ground like it often can in our region. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, the substation fire, there were definitely some arcing, arcing events that happened that really caught some producers off guard who are out in their fields. And so the bottom line is basically if you see a fire uh, burning underneath these power, power lines, just stay out of the way. Um, it's, it's not worth it. Find a safer place to suppress the fire. And you know, let it burn through that area and, and deal with trying to put it out once it's out of that area. But you know, at least staying, you know, when that those arcing events happen, they can also happen, you know, a surprisingly distance from the line. So even if you're not directly underneath them, you still don't want to be, you know, within several hundred feet of them when you have a fire burning. Um, just since we're on the topic of power line safety, you know, even when there's not a wildfire, uh, these lines can pose a risk if one falls on top of a piece of equipment or if a farming incident was to happen. Um, so, you know, you can see there's several different farming implements that pose uh, a risk under these lines. Uh, obviously, operator error was a little bit of an issue here with this particular individual that got their drill and everything stuck underneath this power line here. So just some real quick considerations. Let's say an unfortunate event that you get stuck in something like this. What should you do? And so when a uh, short like this happens in the line, basically, uh, you know, the computers that run the, the transmission lines these days, they get a, a notice that, you know, oh, there's a short in the line and it will try to re-energize that line. And often it will try to re-energize it three separate times before sometimes after the third time, if the short continues, it will try to turn that line off. 
Um, but however, though, BPA has said that often it can take nine to 10 re-energizing events before they finally turn that line off. So you might think there might just be three, but sometimes their computers have glitches and they don't stop. So basically, bottom line is just assume that this is charged if you get stuck in it. First thing you need to do is call 911. Uh, 911 can get a hold of BPA and those dispatchers can basically you know, tell BPA what's going on. They can uh, contact the right person at BPA and get that line turned off so you're not in danger anymore. Uh, and then first responders can be on their way to help you as well. Uh, there is one risk, though, that unfortunately, when you do get tangled in in an electrical line, that this can often cause uh, fire to start in your piece of equipment. Uh, so obviously, you know, call 911. But if you are in a vehicle or a piece of equipment that start starts to ignite and is on fire, that is obviously a, a big risk and danger to you. And so you need to act when that happens. Um, so the big takeaway is jump, clearly jump away from the piece of equipment. Um, stepping down is when you're going to cause that voltage to flow through you to the ground. So that's the big takeaway. If you have to jump out of the vehicle, land with both feet on the ground at the same spot. So again, the, the key takeaway is that separation of electrical current between your legs, that's what's going to allow the current to flow through you and shock you. So if you bunny hop or just shuffle, keeping both feet on the ground at the same time, that is going to greatly reduce your risk of being electrocuted. So uh, hopefully, Hopefully you don't get stuck in electrical line, but it's good to know these are some considerations, and especially if you have a fire around uh, electrical lines, get out of the way. Um, the other big takeaway that BPA made was that when these power lines are get heated, a lot of the lines are already at, you know, the lines that go, they're hanging out over our canyons and in, in agricultural fields. A lot of those are at minimum clearance already as it is. And so when these fires happen, uh, a lot of those lines are, are made out of aluminum and, and light density uh, metals. And so when you have a tremendous amount of heat directly underneath it, it will cause those lines to start, start sagging. And that's other concerns. If you're parked underneath one of those, that sagging could potentially come all the way to the ground and actually land on top of you or your piece of equipment. Um, so bottom line, just don't, don't get on the power lines when you see a wildfire burning through the area. So with that, I'll get started my actual presentation plan for day fuels in the agricultural landscape. And again, just trying to build some context uh, for some of the stuff Katie's going to be talking about after me and also for some of the research work that I've been doing as well. All right, so here's just kind of an outline of where I'm going with this presentation this afternoon, talking about fuels in the agricultural landscape. Um, so basically creating some context for the different fuel characteristics that we need to be aware of. Um, and then also going into kind of three main drivers of, of fuel influence on fire behavior, uh, fuel loading, simply how much is there on the landscape, uh, the chemical composition of that fuel, are there volatile oils in those plants that can make them burn um, hotter? Um, the range on uh, fire behavior in wheat. And so fire behavior can be, uh, well, is indicated here in this triangle that we have the fire behavior triangle, but we also have the, the basic fire triangle. Um, so remember, what are the three things that we need for fires to happen? Uh, we need to have a heat source, we need to have fuel that's burning, and we also need to have oxygen. However, how that fire behaves is more complex and is determined by this fire behavior triangle. Um, so obviously weather and topography playing the influencing fire behavior, uh, but also fuel does. Another thing is we think about when there is a fire, what, what is the main component that we can uh, change before the fire happens? You know, we, it's, it's hard to change the slope or topography of our landscape around our farms and ranches. We also can't necessarily predict or know what the weather is going to do. Uh, but we can change fuel, specifically, you know, the amount on the landscape easily, how it's arranged and its moisture. And if we change those components by changing the fuel, we can influence fire behavior and hopefully make it a more easier and safer spot for firefighters and ourselves to engage in putting it out. So fuels are classified into four primary groups, grasses, brush, timber, and slash. Uh, the most, most of this presentation will focus on grasses and brush that are more common fuel types in some of our agricultural areas uh, here in Eastern Oregon. 
And the differences between these groups are related to the fuel load and the distribution of the fuel among the size classes. And so, you know, often when we look at the agricultural landscape, we don't necessarily refer to, you know, fuel classes, uh, but we do have these basic fuel groups. Wildland firefighting agencies also have different fuel classes that they further break down some of these different fuel types. Um, you know, for our purposes, you know, the grasses themselves are very complex fuel classes just among the, the grass fuel group as well. So these pictures here are just showing, you know, how, you know, different grasses especially behave different than some of these other fuel groups. Often they're uh, more flashier fuels that burn, burn more readily. And, you know, they though they may not produce as much heat for as long, they could definitely generate high pulses of heat for short duration of time. So a real basic level, we have fuel arrangement. You know, simply how are those fuels arranged on the landscape? And so thinking about, you know, agricultural fuel types or uh, out on the range, we obviously have this vertical um, vertical fuel arrangement that where you look directly down into the fuels, how are they arranged vertically? You know, a big thing that this photo here demonstrates is just, you know, the um, porosity between those different fuels. So, you know, when you think about making a campfire, obviously, you often have those different pieces of wood kind of spaced out so there's plenty of oxygen yet can get in the fire to drive it. And so this is one characteristic is the fuel arrangement a lot of grasses and agricultural crops are such that they allow a lot of oxygen into the flames that allow it to, to burn really flashy and readily. Also with, with agricultural crops, you know, we specifically arrange fuels in different ways to um, in terms of our establishment and harvest harvesting of those of that crop. And so, you know, crops are also fuels though. And so here's one example that, you know, we have a particular vertical arrangement of agricultural crops are uh, normally in rows. And so what the takeaway with this is, you know, think about the wind direction that's driving the fire behavior. We've seen that the wind direction do a lot with the row direction. So if the, the wind direction is burning, is, is going parallel with these rows, we would anticipate and we've seen that the wildfire behavior is that it um, moves much more readily and rapidly because basically there's just this continuous uh, wick that the wind is pushing the flames through. However, when the fire is, excuse me, however, when the wind is perpendicular to these rows, suddenly you have a break in the fuel continuity that's going to help slow that rate of fire spread down. So as I've been describing and making a, an analogy of this, but basically, you no know, wildfire fuels are just like our campfire. And so grasses, especially grasses, are not a really large piece of wood that's going to take a long time to burn. They can burn, burn fairly readily just with that little match or little spark. Um, we'll also talk more about, you know, the, the composition of the particular vegetation that's burning in terms of its chemical composition and how much of it there can also make a large influence as well. But just, just think about basically cheatgrass really is kind of arranged such that it's this little campfire that's got lots of oxygen to get in there to burn it burn around it uh, and it's a very small fuel that doesn't take much heat or energy to get it ignited. So you know I've been hinting that vertical arrangement can make a, a large difference. Um, likewise if the fuel is laying down on the ground it also changes it. So this is just a short video. You know this is basically what we'd expect standing wheat to look like, uh, standing stubble excuse me, So we can see that, you know, the vertical arrangement, such as a wheat stubble here is such that it takes a little bit longer to get started. It can generate a lot of heat once it gets going though. And so this arrangement obviously differs from an unharvested wheat crop where the vertical arrangement is more continuous. It has more of a canopy on it that definitely influences the fire behavior as well. So let's say that vertical arrangement is such that it's actually more horizontally arranged uh, on the, the ground. And so that's one thing that, you know, after falling harvest, there's a lot of residue that's spread around the lower canopy. And so, you know, it's, it's a more receptive fuel bed. And you can see the, the fuel here, it's, it's arranged such that there's still plenty of oxygen getting in between the different blades of grass, um, but stacked on top of each other. So it burns much more readily and continuously. 
And you can see, you know, dramatic more heat being produced out of that than just the standing wheat that I just showed. Um, however, we, we also have cheatgrass, which this is what I would refer to as flashy fire behavior. It's uh, very flashy. And it burns very hot and really there as well. So again, you notice the arrangement of cheatgrass is such that it has pretty good uh, vertical arrangement, but also horizontal fuel with litter that produces that makes it such a really fuel to burn. So just, just trying to give you a few comparisons of how different fuels are arranged and how that can influence uh, fire behavior when you think about what fuels look like in your backyard or also in your fields as well. Um, so fuel load, you know, it's pretty simply just how much fuel is out there in a particular spot in the landscape. And so that's one thing that we've seen that's changed in our, a lot of our agricultural areas that we used to do a lot of tillage in our fallow ground, uh, areas where crops uh, were not being planted to conserve soil moisture. Then in the past, we'd use tillage in those areas for weed control. Uh, but luckily, you know, modern farming practices have progressed such that we're leaving a lot more residue on the soil surface. And as a result, we're, we're doing great wonders for the soil and reducing soil and water erosion. However, like I said, you know, just simply looking at from a fuel loading standpoint, suddenly we have a lot more fuel out here in these fields. And so that's why one of the large drivers why we're seeing changes in fire behavior here is just uh, farming practices have changed that we have more residue on the surface, which is good for farmers, good for returns, but it does pose a little bit more of a, a wildfire risk. The other thing that really influences wildfire behavior in eastern Oregon and other areas that are dominated by rangelands and crops, dryland crops in particular, is just simply how much rainfall that you get. So I really like this graphic that shows in Nevada two very different years with different rainfall and fire patterns as a result. So 2003, uh, their precipitation for the year was one inch below average. Uh, and as a result, they only had 12 fires and they only burned about 14,000 acres. However, you can see 2005, two years later, they had four inches above average. And, you know, the number of fires went from 12 to nearly 50 uh, and over a million acres burned. And so that's why it makes a huge, huge uh, difference in that. And I personally was expecting to see more wildfires last fire season due to the increased uh, precipitation last spring. Uh, knock on wood, we didn't get as much, uh, but it also makes me a little bit more concerned about this falling fire season that we're going to have a lot of fuels built up from last year. Uh, plus, it seems like we continue to be on a wet trend this year. We're going to have a lot of annual grasses and annual vegetation that's going to be uh, well above average. So just something to keep in mind. So the other thing with fuel load too, and particularly thinking about, as I described, changed farming practices where there's a lot more residue on the soil during the fire season. And so just uh, food for thought here, that one bushel of wheat produced uh, leaves 100 pounds of residue behind after harvest. Farmers manage this residue in different ways that obviously some people uh, cut it lower to the ground. And so as a result, that residue is still there. It's just not as high vertically arranged. Uh, but either way, you're still getting up with 100 pounds of residue left, even if it's mowed and, and moved down lower in the canopy. Um, so, you know, for example, if there's a 40 bushel wheat crop, that leaves two tons of wheat residue behind following harvest. And, you know, some of that, a lot of that will be degraded by the next fire season. Um, and just to give some kind of context here, often in our region, you know, a typical year, often you would see 60, 70 bushels produced. So typically, you know, three tons of residue left behind, I think would be pretty standard to see here in the northern part of the county. Um, for example, last year, though, we had a, a 90 to 100 bushel wheat crop. You know, there's probably four and a half tons of residue that was produced from that as a result. So again, this next fire season, there could be a lot of residue left in fallow fields that could drive some fire behavior as well. Uh, notice also here, I have different visualizations. Really, I'm just trying to give you a visual of, you know, what does three tons to the acre look like in terms of fuel? And so this one, three tons per acre kind of indicates that. Um, also, think about livestock management as well. These different photos are just showing basically a grazed area on the left, ungrazed on the right, and you can see ungrazed uh, leaving 1.5 tons to the acre behind. 
And so to bring all this together, you know, what does this tons of the acre really mean? Trying to think about fire behavior. Um, this is kind of a breakdown that they've done, they've done experiments in the past. You know, basically, if we burn this much fuel, how much heat will it produce? And so basically, they take fuel that's, you know, three tons of the acre. It's going to result 1,200 BTUs when they, when they burn that. And then if you burned a square foot of that fuel at the three tons per acre amount, that would be high enough to boil one pint of water. Um, or that would be similar to burning 1,200 matches all at once. So I really like that analogy. Um, sorry to get you hungry, but also calories burned here is also a good comparison for heat released. Um, so that three ton per acre wheat field, uh, you basically have 687 king size Snickers candy bars that are being burned all at once. Um, so you can imagine that could release a lot of heat. And so when you think about this with your, you know, fire management, just realize that when areas that you do have three tons of the acre of fuel, um, that's going to be pretty hot to get real close to with anything. Um, so when you see a fire that happens, kind of help that guide your management, your, your suppression tactics, obviously, oh, we have a lot of tons of fuel in that area. We should probably not get near that when the fire is coming in and probably shouldn't anchor off our, our wildfire suppression efforts anywhere close to that fuel there it has so much residue. Um, and also likewise, just areas that aren't grazed or areas that we don't manage grasses in our backyards. You know, if you have that much fuel that's laying there, that's how much heat it's going to produce. So it's worth using fuel management techniques to reduce those fuels. So moving on to chemical composition influence on fuels, uh, sagebrush is one in particular that can burn pretty hot and release a lot of heat from it. Long flame lengths produced as well, often a lot of embers generated as well. Uh, and all, you know, also other comparisons, think about um, juniper trees as well, especially ornamental juniper trees that people plant right next to their homes. Um, those have a chemical composition such that they might look green, but they have a lot of volatile oils that make them burn very hot. And again, so for example, in this photo here, you can see this is a juniper tree that's torching off. You can see it's releasing a lot of heat. So one particular fuel that always interests me is uh, scotch brome, which primarily grows in Western Oregon, but you'll see it in areas of Hood River as, as well now. And so, you know, scotch brome, it looks very green. Obviously now it's flowering in this picture, it looks very green. Um, later in the year, it will dry out, but it still looks very green. You're like, well, that, you know, that's not gonna burn very hot. Uh, but the chemical composition, such there's a lot of volatile oils in it, um, that you can see it, it burns extremely readily, uh, produces very large flame lengths. Um, so definitely you have scotch brim on your property. That's something you want to manage to get rid of. Um, uh, gorse is often a common uh, cousin of scotch brim that's along the coast. That's also something you're going to have to watch out for. So just guiding that, you know, sometimes just because the tree or the shrub looks green, uh, doesn't mean it's not going to burn and, and produce a lot of surprisingly heat once it gets hot enough. So keep that in mind. So look, think about fuel moisture here. Again, basically fuel moisture, quite simply, is just how much fuel is left in that fuel when you, you're, you're squeezing your hand with, with pine needles. How wet do they feel? Do they feel damp? Um, are they soaked or do they feel extremely dry? And so scientifically, we determine fuel moisture by basically go out, sample without fuel. You immediately weigh it with its wet weight. You dry it out, and then you uh, divide it by the dry weight, and you get you know a sense of how much of that initial weight was comprised of, of moisture. Fairly simple to determine. So those fuel moisture levels, obviously, we, we know that when you look at cheatgrass in the middle of summer, that's pretty dry. Um, and so this particular graph, I like how the chart, I appreciate how they talk about this, um, especially with grasses here. I won't look so much in trees and shrubs, but grasses, you know, you get to 30 to 50%, it, it becomes a dead fuel. Traditionally, live fuel moisture, when we wait, measure that should be between 30 and 300%. And we'll talk about this uh, more later as well. But again, basically, once you get, you know, below 30%, that basically is a completely cured dead fuel. It's going to burn extremely readily. Um, in comparison, you know, if it's above 100%, probably not going to burn much at all. So just keep that in mind that the fuel moisture can really change how that fuel influences and drives fire behavior and spread. So particularly when we're talking about grasses and cheatgrass, for example, 
these are some fuel moistures to be aware of that, you know, if you see fuel moistures of low 5%, that's when you know you're going to have extreme fire behavior. Um, once the fuel moisture, you know, is above 20%, it's not as likely to spread. So, you know, what's a large driver when you think about what's a large driver that results in our fuels drying out more rapidly in the summer? So obviously it's, you know, when does the precipitation stop? But the biggest thing is a lot of these fuels, once they become a dead fuel below 30%, they basically will adjust to that relative humidity. And so our small uh, grasses and shrubs, you know, when that we have one day of really low humidity, basically that fuel dries out instantly to match that relative humidity. And that's when you can see extreme fire behavior. Typically when the RH is below 30%, that's when it's really gonna be driving out our fuels and really driving fire behavior as a result. So again, moisture content of cheatgrass. I like this because often it's a visual thing that we can see the cheatgrass uh, drying out on the landscape every spring. Uh, you know, you think about last spring, it's pretty interesting that uh, in March, it was very dry in March. There was cheatgrass that was already starting to cure out and look like straw basically on the landscape. It was already looking brown. Uh, but then we had, you know, some additional dramatic flushes of rainfall in April. And so we kept getting, you know, they kind of had three or four major flushes of cheatgrass last spring. Um, you know, a traditional year that we um, kind of have more consistent rainfall patterns through the spring, usually you would see it looking fairly green, uh, April, May, but then once you start getting into May, you're going to start, start transitioning to that purple stage, and it will eventually dry out, you know, by, by June, sometime by in the middle of June, it usually is dried out perfectly like this straw. And so I'm also showing you this just to keep in mind that when cheatgrass is in this purple stage, uh, it can still burn. It's not going to, you're, you're still going to see fire behavior. It's just going to be a little bit more relaxed than when we have a fire burning in that material in August or September, for example. So again, these are some fuel moistures I took last year in June. Rabbit brush is also another species to keep in mind with chemical composition. It can uh, burn hot like sagebrush has a lot of volatile oils in it. Uh, I measured that cheatgrass in the purple stage was about 56% fuel moisture. Cheatgrass uh, that was pretty dried out, like here all the way on the right, I was I was detecting that was about 49%. 49% uh, actually is pretty high for June. I feel like there's solace and green that's left in it. Uh, but that's why, you know, we see that change too, typically. Um, early June, don't see much fire behavior, but by the middle, the end of June, that fuel moisture drops low enough that you start seeing a lot more ex explosive fire behavior in, in starts that are more common. And this picture here is just a quick story that I have that I used to do a lot of prescribed burning with an agency fairly similar to the Nature Conservancy, uh, where we did a lot of prescribed burning in Western Washington. Uh, for habitat restoration purposes on joint based loose McCord and also on some nature nature preserves that were managed by Department of Natural Resources there. Um, so we did a prescribed fire once at Mima Mounds. And so here's one thing to make you think about fire behavior as well. Um, you know, you see all of these little mounds out here, the Mima Mounds. So we know that topography influences fire behavior. So, I mean, what, how do, would you picture a fire burning in these fuels given these little rises? Uh, and the answer is that it, it often was fairly explosive that you'd get bursts of energy that even though these hills, you know, they're only five, 10 feet high, maybe um, they have enough of a slope that you could really get some explosive fire behavior coming off of these small mounds. But the main reason I have this picture here is just look at the fuels. You definitely have some green fuels left in here. And you would think, you know, some relaxed fire behavior. Um, but from my experience, probably one of the more most exciting prescribed fires I was on was we did a prescribed burn here. It was after the, the Department of Natural Resources, they had gone through and they had sprayed glyphosate throughout here basically to kill all the vegetation off. They had a lot of invasives that they were had been trying to kill off. Uh, and so because they basically, you know, essentially killed all the vegetation, uh, we went out there on a day that the relative humidity was, was starting to drop a little bit. And we had really extreme fire behavior because basically, you know, these fuels, everything was a dead fuel moisture because they had glyphosated the whole thing. Um, so just keep in mind, again, if you're in an area where you've done some fuel management or you've managed invasive vegetation with herbicides, uh, once that once those weeds dry out and are dead, they're still sitting there as active fuel that can burn. Um, just looking at 
time here. We're going to kind of speed through some of this a little bit. Um, these next images are from a study that was done in Australia looking at fire behavior and dryland wheat. And so basically just the big takeaway, you know, they found that in wheat fields that have not yet been harvested, if those caught on fire, you can see flame lengths from 11.5 to 16 feet high, moving at four to six miles per hour. And again, that's without the wind blowing. They burn these on calm days. But if the wind was blowing, you can imagine that it would be traveling a much more rapid rate of speed than just that amount there. So this is a field that, you know, they had harvested, but a lot of residue left on the field, but simply just by harvesting it, removing that grain component from it, uh, they found that flame lengths reduced almost more than half, that, you know, flame lengths were still 6 to 7.5 feet, still high enough to, to make direct suppression difficult, but not impossible, and traveling at a slower rate of speed as well. In a baled wheat field, so this is one that's been harvested, and then they baled the residue, extremely relaxed fire behavior, as you would expect. Uh, flame lengths just over a foot and a half, traveling very slowly. I mean, this is an area that if the wind wasn't blowing. This is an area that you could easily put the fire out uh, without being too worried about it. Uh, cheatgrass, however, you know, it's it's shorter than unharvested wheat, but also exhibits explosive fire behavior. Uh, flame lengths either easily getting up to eight feet with a rate of fire spread of four miles per hour. So in summary, you know, basically the unharvested wheat fields, you really got to be careful when you're dealing with fire there. Uh, if you live close to wheat fields, just keep keep this in the back of your head that if fire does get in there, it's going to be it's going to be an exciting day. Um, uh, so then to conclude here, I just want to briefly uh, describe a research project that I did last summer that touches on these different fire behavior components. Um, so basically the concept of what I did here is I was trying to determine how far hot embers could spread from different agricultural fuels. And I got this idea from a professor, David Plunk, who's in Corvallis with OSU, that he's done this with different shrubs and trees that he's burned, trying to detect the amount of embers that they release and how far they can travel. So basically, I put different fuels here on this, uh, in between these bricks, basically making it uh, mimic what you would find in a wheat producer's field with similar row spacing. Uh, you know, basically this was, um, we had three rows here and each row was about six and a half feet long. So basically about 20 square feet here of material that was burned. And so basically we let them off and then we try to keep track of how far the embers went. And these cloths here are such that uh, if an ember was high enough to burn this, we count that as a hot ember. But you often have a lot of firebrands that are produced by fuel, but they're not necessarily hot enough to ignite something when they land. So we really want So I've got some short videos here to show just really illustrating and hopefully kind of help you remember um, what these fires can really do. And I want to just shout out Mid Columbia Fire and Rescue is really helpful allowing us to do these here at the peak of the fire season. We did not want to be burning these anywhere close to vegetation that could actually catch on fire. So first up here, we've got cheatgrass. Very flashy fuel. It's not going to take long to burn. So I just want to clarify too, you know, does anybody know the difference between flame height versus flame length? As we purposely had this pole here, the very top of this was 12 feet high. And so, you know, flame height is directly how high is it? You know, flame height is how tall is the flame, but flame length is actually how long is it? So here you can see, you know, it's, it's almost at 11 feet high. But the flame length, if we made that standing pole vertical at, at an angle to match that flame, we would probably have a flame length of almost 12 feet. And so that's why it's important when you think about fuel management, potentially with, with fuel breaks, if you're trying to break the vegetation up with a lot of these, you know, easily if the flame length lays all the way down, you could easily see, you know, 15 feet of travel with those flames. So keep that in mind. Um, so the wheat stubble burned, didn't burn that hot as you would expect. And maybe Columbia Fire and Rescue knew we were here, but it's kind of funny how they roll up on scene as we're testing this one out. 
But you can see we're zoomed in here. Flame lengths are, you know, they're less than five feet by far. Uh, and then standing weight, definitely the exciting one here. Just kind of show you what that looks like. So again, you know, the, the flame height right here, it's burning right next to the pole. I mean, those it's easily 14, 15 feet high. So if you haven't seen a wheat fire be before, just know just how, how hot and intense these fires can get. So it gets out pretty quickly, but you can still see there's a lot of heat that's still down here burning. So just real quick of this graph, trying to summarize what we found. Uh, I'm still kind of analyzing a lot of the data that we produced from this, but we did several different burns like that with wheat, um, with the standing wheat. So cheatgrass and stubble, we didn't see any embers being really generated, but you know, standing unharvested wheat, basically those grains at the top of the head, basically um, those get, get airborne and lofted and they, and they remain hot for a long duration of time. Um, so we saw, you know, th this chart indicates the number of embers uh, by distance away from the front of the fire. So you can see, I mean, we, we definitely had, in terms of number of embers, we had a lot landing out here, you know, two feet out. The majority of them are kind of in this area here. Uh, but it was really striking that we did get some that were all the way out here at almost seven feet away from the fire front. Uh, so again, that's something to keep in mind. Again, this is on a calm day that if we had wind, uh, these embers, definitely hot embers likely would have flown dramatically far, farther than just seven and a half feet. But we we answered our objective question just simply you know, on a calm day, how far can you expect these embers to go? So, you know, this is a management decision to know that, you know, if you're putting in a disc break or a fire break during a fire, you know, if, if those embers can simply go uh, almost seven feet out, you definitely need to make these lines, you know, at least 20, 30, 40 feet. You know, if it's a windy day, you're looking more at needing 40 to 50 feet. So just keep that in mind that that's the, that's the size of a fuel break that we're, we're probably needing for a lot of these fires. Um, you know, a lot of producers know that well, but uh, as Rick said, you know, it's always kind of chase around the clock. Uh, it's easy to put in one. Uh, what go across it with a disc once, but you have to do multiple trip trips back, you know, to clean that pass up, and then you need to widen it out as well. Um, so just some management takeaways from the research there as well. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Katie, and let me make you a co-host to do that. So trying to build some context here for what fire behavior does and, and things to realize, and Katie's going to kind of use that information with some of these PCLs. Okay, now your co-host. And let me back up here and, and introduce Katie as well. So I'm pleased to have Katie Wolstein here. Uh, she's uh, OSU Rangeland Fire Extension Specialist. That's part of the new OSU Fire Extension Program. And she's based out of Burn. So I appreciate her zooming in today uh, to talk about her great presentation. Yeah, thanks for having me today, and and thanks for everyone who's here and and hanging in with us on a on a Friday afternoon. Um, and so today, um, as Jacob has really nicely set us up, um, I'm going to speak with you about um, potential control locations, which um, you may or may not have heard about recently. But considerations for establishing these, so identifying locations, um, how do you coordinate and prioritize uh, these treatments? Assessing uh, treatment needs along along PCLs, characterizing fuels, um, drivability, and then treatment monitoring and maintenance needs. There we go. Uh, and so to begin, and to many of you may be familiar from prior experience or what Rick shared today, um, wildfire response uses existing or creates new control lines. Um, and this is for access or deploying resources to fight fire. And this may be direct or indirect attack. Um, and these, these passages are also used for tactical decision making. And so there's a big difference in um, line placement um, if it's 
these lines are uh, placed before a fire incident, kind of preemptively thinking strategically versus during an incident. During an incident, it's an emergency measure, right? You're using the best available information during the situation, um, but nonetheless, and necessarily, these are reactive lines, right? Whatever the need is at that moment to stop um, a potentially fast moving fire. If we think about placement of these lines before fire incidents, um, we can be thoughtful and strategic um, because we're, you know, out of that emergency situation. And so identifying lines in advance can help um, manage ecological impacts. And so for um, my part of the world in southeastern Oregon and, and northeastern Oregon certainly as well, is this area likely to be colonized by invasive annual grasses if we run a disc along the roadside? So that could be an important kind of long-term ecological impact question. Uh, if these lines are collaboratively identified in advance, uh, we can have fire professionals, locals like farmers and ranchers and ecologists, wildfire, uh, wildlife managers, um, all discussing their placement. We can also improve the social acceptability of those lines as well. And so these lines identified in advance are what I'm going to be talking about today. And so these are called potential control locations, and these are pre-planning um, for fire. These are tools to establish landscape scale wildfire response options. And so the thought is, if firefighters are to effectively respond to fires, they need reliable routes for, as I said earlier, deploying resources and making these important decisions. And so these PCLs are places identified in a landscape where fires can realistically be stopped on most days, um, given existing roads, landscape features, and then expected fire behavior in that area. And the thought is uh, to kind of tie these lines together so you're compartmentalizing the landscape. Um, so first for safety, right? You want your lines to tie in somewhere, um, but also offer opportunities for strategic fire management. And uh, PCL support um, a decision support tool called potential operational delineations. And that is a different conversation, but know that those two concepts are, are tied. And so today, identifying PCLs in advance, um, as I said earlier, it allows for community input on their placement. Um, and then these preemptive fuel treatments will better ensure that these corridors, again, identified in advance, are more likely to be safe and offer good operational space um, for, for firefighters when they do need them. So I'm gonna spend the next few minutes um, just covering some considerations for establishing PCLs, if that makes sense for your area. Um, and so we're gonna discuss identifying locations for these lines, um, the important coordination and prioritization conversations that need to occur. Uh, I'll talk about assessment and that ties in really nicely with um, what Jacob just shared with us all about um, fire behavior and fuel conditions. And lastly, I'll touch briefly on treatment and monitoring and, and maintenance of these lines. And so in terms of identifying locations, so locations are potential, it's in the name, but the thought is where can firefighters reasonably respond to a fire uh, if the fire were in, you know, X place on the landscape. And so these lines need to reflect expected fire behavior in an area. And so the idea is that consultation between fire professionals and then local experts, such as farmers and ranchers like yourselves who've seen fire, um, they can collaboratively um, draw lines with the highest likelihood of containment using knowledge of how fire behaves in these places. And then, as I said earlier, connect these lines into um, to create compartments. And so considerations for finding these areas on your landscape with a high likelihood of success. Um, first off, think about your natural barriers. So if you have water features, those are great. Um, ideally, these lines go through areas in light fuels. That's less treatment work um, down the road. Uh, past fire scars can be useful for this. Um, we use a lot of roads in southeastern Oregon, and that's because these are remote rangelands, uh, really big landscapes. So roads are often your best option. Uh, ridge tops are also a really good strategy in terms of um, how fire behaves in those places. 
And along those lines, it's important to avoid, if you can, um, underslung or mid-slope lines in steep terrain. Um, also, you know, chimneys, chutes, um, canyons, places you wouldn't want to be uh, if there were a fire. Other things to consider are the management history. Um, so if some field treatments have already been done um, in some of the places you're looking at, that could be really beneficial to leverage and extend the um, effects of those treatments. And then other important questions might be, what do you know about fuel conditions along the lines you're thinking about? Uh, what's typical weather in the area? So uh, what direction are the prevailing winds on most days? Uh, another big one might be where, um, for those of you who have lived in a place for a long time, where have there been a lot of human ignitions? It might be good to have a control line in those areas. Uh, if you partner with um, fire agencies, you might use some analytics, so the suppression difficulty index or some fire behavior modeling or some risk maps might also inform um, these potential placements for these lines. And so as an example, um, from Harney County, where I'm based, uh, we have the Harney County Wildfire Collaborative, and they had a 300,000 acre area in the Stinking Waters Mountain. It's a pilot project. Um, and as you can see from this fire perimeter map, we've had a lot of large fires in that area. Uh, it's a vast and rugged landscape, and so that makes fire response really difficult. And so the Wildfire Collaborative established potential control locations, um, locations where incident management teams, firefighters, RFPAs um, can safely and feasibly respond to fires in this place. And so here are those lines. And so the process for identifying them, uh, it started with fire professionals uh, first proposing kind of an initial cut of lines. Um, the fire planner with BLM called it doodling lines. Um, but, you know, where where historically have they found that they can get IM teams? Um, again, looking at things like topography, known, known fire behavior, bringing in some analytics. But the important piece of this was the Wildfire Collaborative engaged RFPAs um, to provide feedback on proposed lines. And it was really amazing. Uh, I'm glad we got the feedback. There were conversations about where can an engine actually make it down a road? Is that actually a road at all? Uh, a map is really different than, than real life. Um, you know, where might there be locked gates? So those kinds of conversations are important as well. This next step, um, you know, I, I put it step two, but really this is happening throughout, but these are important questions. So coordinating um, and prioritizing. So uh, I'm in a landscape where there's a lot of public land. I know it's a little bit different in the gorge, for example, um, but I do know that you all have neighbors. And when we think about managing fire at the landscape scale, that often means that multiple landowners, um, maybe also agencies need to be involved in that decision. And so as you kind of sketch out potential control locations, are these lines crossing ownership? So here, this is the Stinking Waters project area. And so purple is private ownership. Um, and that peach color is BLM. And you can see the lines in green there um, crosses a lot of different ownerships. Those are all different people. It's something like 60 landowners in the area and then also BLM. Um, and so this isn't just a one person kind of drawing a line through their property. This kind of landscape necessitates all these people talking to each other um, and working together. The other question is, is it feasible to implement a proposal like this? Um, is it possible to piece together the different um, resources to potentially do the work along these lines? And then also when we're talking about federal lands, also the authorities, do we have clearance to treat along roads, for example? And so the next big question is, how on earth do you prioritize? And so I have a slide um, going back to the Harney County example. It's tough to prioritize and it's going to be different for all of you everywhere, but this is this is how we did it in this area. So first, I want to say again, these lines are termed potential uh, for a reason, and that's because not all of them can be used in their current condition, their proposals, right? And what we found in this project area, um, there's about 300 miles total, those PCLs, the black lines there in the figure, 
Um, and a majority of those locations are going to need some sort of treatment before they can actually function as PCLs are meant to. So um, a place where firefighters can reliably deploy equipment. And so 300 miles is too many miles. We can't reasonably treat everywhere and certainly not every year when we think about um, we're a fine fuels driven system. And so that requires, you know, something like grazing needing to happen every spring. And so for this area, for this project, the wildfire collaborative's goal was to prevent the spread of invasive annual grasses um, and being able to stop large wildfires because you saw the fire perimeter map, there's been a lot. And so given this goal, we used multiple data sources to model um, the probability of transition of existing plant communities to annual grass dominance if there were to be a fire. And so that's mapped here. And so it's, um, you know, it's a little bit overwhelming to take a look at, but basically green is, you know, if it were to burn, there's a good chance that those plant communities are gonna recover um, to their basic structure and function. Where we have red, those plant communities, even if they look good right now, if they were to burn in a wildfire, it's highly unlikely that they'll be able to recover and they're very vulnerable to colonization by invasive grasses. And then a little asterisk, the gray areas on that map are places that are already in your grass dominated. And so the reason we use this map is this um, really supports the goals of this particular group for this project area. And so given that, uh, we found that this north-south line, um, this PCL, um, I have it here in blue, it, it roughly separates an area of low probability of transition to invasives, so you know, more green and yellow, um, from high, high probability, the, the red area. And so if we want to be able to stop fire from reaching, uh, and I should add fires usually move this way um, from west to east through this area. And um, we have Windrose data that supports that. And so if we want to prevent this red area from burning, then we really need to be able to stop fire on that blue line. And so our group, again, given its specific goals, and you all will have different goals, um, it's a priority for this PCL to be functional. And so instead of treating the 300 miles of lines, which is impossible and expensive, uh, we're going to focus on this blue line. And so our next step that I'm going to go over includes assessing the road and fuel bed conditions to gain a better understanding of the work that will be needed to produce a safe and functional control location for this blue line to truly be a reliable resource during fire events. And so um, I, I don't know the condition of roads in your area, but it, they can be a toss up out here. Um, and so the first bit of assessment really is just, are these uh, PCLs drivable in their current state? And so before a fire event, it might be important to estimate something like response time. So how good are these roads? Um, are they actually roads? Again, do they do they actually go through or are they just lines on a map? Um, are these really important segments? If yes, what kinds of improvements are needed? So a lot of questions there and also acknowledging that not all of us have the authority to treat and improve roads. And so keeping in mind who are those partners you need to bring in for these kinds of conversations. The other important piece of the assessment stage is fuel conditions along your PCLs. This is imperative. And that's because, as Jacob really nicely set up for us, um, fuel bed characteristics tell you something about expected fire behavior. And so we're talking about fuel type, any hazards along those PCLs, what's the fuel load, and somewhat related that fuel arrangement and continuity. And so in rangeland systems like these, uh, we have two different fuel types. Um, fine fuels, which are your grasses, and they act to carry fire across the landscape really well. And then where we get worried is those heavier fuels, those woody fuels, so sagebrush and juniper, um, which tend to be a little bit more hazardous during fire events. And so, um, and that's due to the chemical composition as Jacob mentioned. And so here we have the torching sagebrush 
And so this photo on the right here is an, a photo I took along that priority PCL. And so um, uh, close, closer to where um, I was standing, you can see that the roadside is fairly clear. But as you get uh, to that grove of juniper, um, think about if there were to be a fire. Um, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to be on that road. I wouldn't view that as a good place to control fire if I were surrounded by a wall of juniper. And so those kinds of assessments are, are really important. And when we're thinking about fuel characteristics along these PCLs, um, we're also concerned about, so I mentioned those junipers right along the roadway. So that um, we're thinking about fire line intensity or those flame lengths that the juniper could potentially produce. And the other piece of that is how quickly fire may be spreading. And so as we discussed in the last slide, fuel type influences this, um, but so does the amount of fuel in a spot as, as Jacob went over and, and then also how it's arranged. And so these are examples of just different fuel loads and also fuel arrangements. So the top right photo um, is native intact grass shrub um, uh, fuel. And you can see the, there's actually bare soil in between the plants. And that's because these are perennial bunch grasses. And so that's that's normal and natural. And so if you think about a site like that burning, um, that fire is actually going to move um, fairly slowly because it's going to kind of meander from a clump of grass to clump of grass. And if you don't have any wind, that might be it. Uh, but that photo below um, there on the right we have quite a lot of horizontal fuel continuity. Um, I think that's some cheat grass. And so fire carries really well through a fuel bed like that. And what it will do is we'll get one of those sagebrush torching and then the next and the next. And pretty soon you have something moving really fast through that um, fuel bed and carried through um, the invasive annual grasses. The photo there on the left is a little bit of a mix, right? You can see some bare soil. Um, the grass, we have lower um, horizontal continuity than that last photo. But where I might worry is you can see in that juniper there, those the lowest branches on there um, actually touch or nearly touch the ground. And so we also want to worry, would worry about um, the vertical arrangement of those fuels. And so, again, we don't want to see uh, crown fires or, or have our junipers torching because that contributes to um, more hazardous fire behavior um, and fires that can spread quickly. But also, again, you don't want to be standing next to a flaming juniper. And so I just want to kind of lean into this point a little bit more. I want to stress the importance of inventorying your fuels along your PCLs. Your PCLs are not functional response options during a fire event if they are not safe. And so assigning a fuel model is one way um, to characterize fuels at a site, um, and it helps predict potential fire behavior under given conditions, um, and it, again, identify appropriate wildfire response tactics. So some of you may have seen a graph like this before. I know Jacob has used them in the past, and it shows um, different fuel types. And so here at the bottom, we have kind of relatively light um, grass shrub. Um, this was the example from the last slide where we have some bare soil. And then kind of in sharp contrast, we have some really heavy decadent shrubs. There's, um, they're packed together. There's some rabbit brush and sagebrush in there. Um, and things can really get going if, if that burns. And so this graph shows, again, how these different um, fuel types, um, and then also how wind speed. So here at the bottom, um, can affect surface fire characteristics. And what that means is this determines whether a firefighter, whether that's you or someone coming in, can engage that fire directly or indirectly. And this is measured by flame length. Um, and so that's up here. And basically, you know, anything under eight feet, um, it's probably okay to directly engage, whether that's with hand tools, if we're at around four feet or with equipment, but anytime those flames get higher than there, you don't want a human on that fire line. And so when these surface fire characteristics are relatively low, and so again, down here fuels uh, you know, the yellow and purple line, it's safe for firefighters 
to, to be there. Right. And then when it gets higher, you don't want to be near that line. And so if flame length is too great, um, fire responders are not going to be able to be on that line. It will not be safe for them. And so the important part to understand is that at high wind speeds, and then in some of these fuel types, like on top, it'll make your PCLs not functional. You don't want those along your PCL. And so what do we do with this info? So start by asking which fire behavior would you rather have along your PCL? Um, you know, this, uh, what is that? 25 foot flames or, you know, something that you can stand next to. Um, the answer is the bottom one. I, I hope everyone got that. And so fire behavior models like this graph can be used to inform treatment decisions. So where along your PCL do you need to turn SH5, those decadent shrubs, into an SH1 or 2? Um, if you treat those fuels, so disrupt continuity, thin hazardous fuels, you're moving the potential fire behavior from here, wall of flames, to down here. And so this leads us to consideration number four. And I want to emphasize for your PCLs to be functional, we want low <laughs> fire behavior. So down here where you can directly um, uh, engage the fire if necessary. And so our final consideration, if your goal is for your PCLs to be safe and functional when you need them, you need to figure out where uh, fuels need to be modified so that you reduce that potential fire behavior. So you have those lower flame lakes or lower surface rates of spread. And so things to be thinking about, you likely won't be able to treat everything everywhere, as I said. So is there somewhere that's really important? Uh, and so that might be collaboratively identified, like in our example from Harney County, um, or it might be something um, local going on. And so I'd mentioned earlier, is there an area that gets a lot of human starts that might really need a PCL around it? And so be thinking about what you wouldn't want to be burning right next to you on the road. So I showed that photo of the junipers along the roadside. And so we'll be thinking about either reducing those fuels, redistributing them, um, or entirely removing them. Another thought at this point is what to do with bare ground. If you're uh, maybe disking along your roadside, um, you need to keep in mind, am I creating an opportunity for a lot of weeds um, that invasive annual grasses to, to colonize? And then you're creating a new kind of problem, which is, again, that creates that high fuel continuity. And so you can really get fire moving quickly through there. The other piece is to think about retreatment timeframes. So we know um, with juniper removal, you're probably going to want to retreat in, in 10 years because removing those large trees uh, gives all the seedlings around a chance to, to really uh, grow up. And so this is just a brief overview. Um, we can get into more detail elsewhere about treatment options, but in terms of reducing fuels, so prescribed fire is a great option for that. Um, targeted grazing, if you're talking about fine fuels. Um, I mentioned disking earlier, so that's disturbing the soil. Um, really helpful for roadsides. As I mentioned, if human ignitions are an issue, that could be a really good option. In terms of modifying fuels, you could think about mowing, which um, for sagebrush that it doesn't remove fuels. So you still have um, some, um, you have fuel there. You're just moving it from tall to kind of shorter. Um, herbicide is another option if you're treating invasive annual grasses or if your interest is thinning sagebrush um, so that you uh, don't have them all clumped together like in that other photo. That could be an option. Um, green strips are something that has been used by uh, Boise BLM planting forage kosher on roads. So um, it, it excludes other uh, things from growing in there, but also that's a safe place for firefighters to, to actually stand in. Um, in terms of your hazardous fuels, be thinking about cutting juniper or again, prescribed fire could be good. Um, you have different options for thinning brush. And then again, it's important for any of these treatments to be thinking down the line, um, how intensive will a post-treatment activity be? Are there going to be weeds coming in? Are there going to be seedlings growing up? Do I need to reseed uh, this ground that I've cleared out? 
So um, importantly, I would work with your local experts to determine the appropriate treatments. Um, it, they would know kind of what the, the, be the best options are um, and what doesn't work in your area. And so this could be um, BLM fuel staff, this could be your NRCS office, your soil and water conservation district, or your CWMAs. Bonus steps. Uh, so again, PCLs are useless if they're not continuous, they're not strategic, and they aren't safe. And so coordinate with local fire staff, your resource staff, your neighbors. Um, unless you own a really large parcel of land, um, PCLs are most useful when they cross multiple ownerships because wildfire occurs at a landscape scale. And so again, consult your local experts on recommended treatments. Um, NRCS, SWCDs have funding for juniper removal, invasive annual grass spraying. Um, and if you're in a mixed ownership, you might engage the main land manager in your area for us BLM. Um, do they have some treatments planned specifically for fuel reductions? Um, if they do, and it's you know next to your property, it might be a great opportunity to um, kind of match what you're doing with them because then you have an outsized effect on fire at a much larger scale. And so in summary, for PCLs, they need to be collaboratively identified in advance to make a difference. Um, it's important to assess the drivability, the fuel conditions, um, fuel conditions and that associated potential fire behavior. Do you want 25 foot uh, flames or do you want four foot flames? This should inform treatment needs. And then keep in mind that those treatments need to be maintained over time. And then it's very likely that you'll need to prioritize. Um, most of the time we can't treat everything. And so where are the most important places given your objectives? And so coordinate with landowners, neighbors, organizations across your landscape to figure out what these objectives might be. And so Jacob, I don't know if we have time for questions, um, but for those of you with smartphones, if you wanna scan this QR code um, and evaluate my teaching today, that would be really helpful. Um, I appreciate your time and I, I can stick around for a question or two. Thank you. Okay, so real quick, what I'm gonna to touch on here for just 10, 15 minutes is this idea of having a perennial uh, <clears throat> vegetative fuel break, or also what's referred to as a green strip. <clears throat> so instead of disking an area or basically, you know, using bare dirt or mineral, you know, taking a section of land down to basically mineral soil that you're removing all the potential combustible material. One option is why don't you put material or vegetation there intentionally that's going to increase that fuel moisture uh, throughout the whole fire season. So once the fire comes through, it's going to hit this green strip here and you'll hopefully go out or either fire behavior will be reduced enough that you and firefighters can easily quickly get in there and put the fire out safely. So green stripping is, I think in my mind, is a, is a better long-term solution for trying to change fire behavior. Uh, it's also more costly in terms of the initial creation of said fuel break. That, you know, uh, disking is something that you have to do every single year when that vegetation greens back up. Similar with herbicides, you know, you're gonna have limited control. Uh, but once you get this established ideas, it would be a long-term control strategy that you're not going to have to do nearly as much maintenance work or maintenance costs going forward. So the pictures here is there's a common vegetation vegetation used uh, over in, in Idaho, particularly around I-84 or around Boise, where they use a lot of forage kochia next to the interstate and other areas where they know they have a lot of uh, starts that happen and basically plant this in those areas and it allows it so that when the wildfire happens, it uh, goes out or basically, you know, it's pretty safe to put the fire out once it gets into the forage kochia. Um, forage kochia is, you know, one that comes to mind, but there are also other plants that you could consider as well. This is what forage kochia looks like uh, in some of the trials that I've been trying to grow it here in um, the mid-Columbia, just outside of the Dalles, out towards Dufer. And so you can see it's a plant that um, definitely safe, stays very green. And it's also, you know, in Idaho, they've had a lot of success of this it's helping out compete cheatgrass in areas that otherwise, you know, it seems like no matter what they do, that cheatgrass just will not go away. But forage kochia seems to be a pretty good competitive plant to use to compete with it. So I did some research 
here basically over the last two years, basically we were looking at, you know, how best to establish a green strip, you know, versus broadcasting uh, plants in, you know, by hand, just uh, throwing the seeds out on the landscape or trying to actually put those directly in the soil with the drilling with a seed drill. Uh, I was trying to determine what species were going to work best is why I looked at a few others in just forage kochia. And then this last summer, basically, I tracked the fuel moisture in the fuel break vegetation and the vegetation of the surrounding area as well to get a sense of just how much it, how much these plant species have different fuel moistures compared to those that are already in the landscape. Um, so as I was saying there, I did look at forage kochia. This is what it looks like in some areas. It's very bushy. Uh, this is one of the rare plants that really look like this. A uh, little, most of them are a little bit more sparse and spread out than this one. Um, this is what forage kochia looks like when it's first coming out of the ground. We also looked at using blue flax. It's another one that's been uh, suggested for use as a vegetative fuel break in other parts of the the West. Another picture of blue flax there. Yarrow is also a good one to consider. I know in Gillum County, a few people have had success of basically uh, seeding this. And in a lot of areas, yarrow can establish pretty well it's on itself. It really likes disturbed sites. Um, but you can see, you know, after a while, it gets kind of tall. But if you keep mowing it and just keep it so you've got the, the short leaves on the yarrow plant, those stay pretty green for quite a while. And they can outcompete other vegetation that might want to move in that would be more flammable. So I just want to shout out, this would not be possible without uh, Diamond K Ranch and the Kayser family that allowed this to take place in a field that they have. As I said, this took place uh, outside of the Dallas towards Dew for a little bit, kind of out in the eight mile area. And so you can see here that basically we uh, did some good site prep here. We dissed the field that we were going to put in this vegetative field break trial. This is what it looked like in April. Um, so you get a sense here of just kind of what that looked like. Um, you know, usually I would say disking is a good enough strategy to, for seedbed prep. Um, you know, I guess we, you could have also ran a cultipacker over this. It would have helped a little bit, but, you know, I think uh, disking is a good way to go. Cultipacking is great if you have one available, um, but, you know, sometimes it's an added expense, expense which is not always necessary. Um, so here, just kind of describing how this um, research trial took place, that we had the field there that I just showed you. Uh, that initially we wanted to do this, and it was in the spring of 2021, uh, extreme drought conditions, not getting much precipitation at all. Um, so basically we decided at least just to do something uh, despite the drought conditions. Uh, I went out there and broadcast seeded uh, by hand and by using one of those handheld uh, broadcast spreaders that I seeded out these different species. Um, I will say broadcasting with those hand spreaders is really tricky. Um, you know, I tried my best to calibrate and, you know, looking back, I really overseed the kosher 31 pounds to the acres, uh, what that extrapolated out to. So hard to know for sure how much you're putting out the, the flax and the yarrow were put out at more typical seeding rates suggested at seven and 18 pounds to the acre. Um, and like I said, we, we didn't have much success with that initially, but uh, luckily we had an underground pipe leak that happened that did allow some subsurface irrigation to take place. And we actually did see some good germination, surprisingly, that uh, late summer and through the summer had some good kochia and vegetative fuel break seedlings coming up. Uh, we also tried a more traditional route, like I said, of drill seeding it in. Uh, we drill seeded it there out there at that field in November 2021. Um, this, you know, was hoping this was going to be a more successful project. And we used a more conventional seeding rate that, you know, drill, you can calibrate a lot better than when you're just uh, spreading those seeds by hand. Um, so we see the at a pound is six pounds to the acre, um, which that's a little bit on the heavy side, but you know, traditionally they suggest uh, two to four pounds to the acre for forage kosher for a fuel break. If you're using a drill, if you're broadcasting it, you should double the rate. Um, so, you know, six pounds per acre could have also been a good broadcasting rate too, just if people are interested in, in trying this out on your place. Um, so six pounds of the acre was a little bit on the heavy side, but again, you know, we want to make sure there was plenty there. Um, we used a grain drill, which again, grain drills are great for grain, but, you know, they're a little bit more finicky for seed as small as forage kosher. Forage kosher is, is smaller than alfalfa seed. 
So it's, it's really finicky to try, try again in the drill. But, you know, I purposely tried it with this setup just because I wanted to see, you know, using the tools I know most producers have available, wanted to see if it was if it would work or not. You know, we definitely had some struggles with using that drill, but, you know, it did get the seed in the ground. Uh, however, we, we saw struggles with the direct seeding. When you think about the weather, November 2021, we were starting to get more moisture. And then in the spring of 2022, we had a very cold spring. Forage coach is a warm season plant. So that cold spring really kind of hindered its germination rate a little bit. Uh, in, the, in addition, there's a, so much moisture in that particular field that we had a lot of annual uh, weeds that really took off. And so we had a lot of weed pressure that we were not able to control well. And so it was a struggle. But under you know a more normal spring, I think it could have been more successful. So just keep that in mind with the results. So this these pictures were taken in the summer of 2021. Again, like I said, that was an extreme drought for our area during that summer. But you can see we did get some uh, forage kosher that came up. You can also see there's a lot of other weeds that also came up with this subsurface irrigation. Uh, but it was good to know that it was successful. Um, you know, I also will just say looking at this, uh, sometimes weeds aren't always a bad thing um, in terms of, of fire suppression. Later in the summer, weeds are often... Uh, broadleaf weeds in particular often have higher fuel moisture than a lot of the annual grasses. And so in some cases, it can kind of help put those fires out a little bit. Um, this is a field in the grain drill that we use to use the direct drill seed application. Last summer, this is what it looked like. You can see some of the annual weed pressure in the background like I was describing there. But you can also see we actually have a fairly healthy stand of of a kochia in this particular area of the field. This is what was, was broadcasted in the spring of 2021. So I kind of touched on some of the struggles with the establishment that we went through. Um, it was good to get some available. You know, I, I would like to redo this establishment trial in the future, hopefully under, you know, more typical weather conditions. Um, but extreme drought to extreme water back to back was difficult. Um, however, we did have enough that was established that we were able to kind of, you know, like I, I was talking about fuel moisture earlier, evaluating this for its fuel moisture and seeing how good it compares to the surrounding vegetation. You know, basically the question is, you know, is it higher, is it significantly higher than like cheatgrass and some of the surrounding vegetation that would justify you wanting to use these species to help reduce fire behavior? So the first variable that we looked like, like looked at was looking at fuel moisture. Uh, this is Keen Kaiser, who was an intern in my office last summer that uh, was a great help on this project. Basically, we went out there, we sampled the different vegetative fuel break species that we were growing in the trial. We sampled them, weighed them to get their wet weight, and then we dried them, oven dried them to a constant weight, dry weight that then we used to determine fuel moisture. Um, also, just want to touch on that we also compared this with a few other species as well. This is curly cup gumweed, which usually is regarded as a weed. It's not a noxious weed, but it is, does have some weed-like characteristics to it. Um, this has been proposed as a fuel break type species in the Great Basin and parts of Utah. Um, and just by chance behind the extension office here in the Dallas, there's a really healthy crop of it that grows at Cirrhosis Park uh, up above it. So we sampled some of that as well. And this shows us the fuel moisture. So when we sampled at the end of July last summer, this is what some of the fuel moistures look like. Um, so again, you can see our typical cheatgrass species here. Fuel, the fuel moisture was below 10%. So obviously it was pretty, it was in a pretty ready state to burn if we had ignited it. Um, there's also intermediate wheatgrass that often is viewed as, as suppressing fire behavior earlier in the summer. Um, a lot of us have it on our property. Intermediate wheatgrass has been seen in the past in conservation areas. Um, you know, basically, it's a really tall grass compared to cheatgrass, and it's it tends to be more spread out on the landscape, and it stays greener in the summer. So we were looking at that as well. Um, again, wheat in a July. You know, most people were had been harvesting their wheat fields around that time, so we knew that fuel was going to be pretty uh, have pretty low fuel moisture. But we kind of curious to quantify that. So the big takeaway here is that. Forage kosher was significantly higher in fuel moisture than cheatgrass uh, and, in, and was by far the standout with the most fuel moisture. Yarrow also had a lot of fuel moisture in it, in it as well. Uh, curly cup and flax, uh, also good species that really um, 
put that fuel moisture higher than say cheatgrass or some of the other more flammable vegetation that it could be a solution as well. So same species here, but just fast forwarding to us sampling at the, the beginning of September. And so here you can see it's later in the fire season, fuel moistures are starting to go down. Uh, cheatgrass is still hanging out at 10%, extremely dry. Forage kochia really stood out here that still had significantly higher fuel moisture than cheatgrass and many of the other plant species that we were sampling as well. Uh, again, yarrow and flax and curly cup are also decent ones to possibly use for uh, vegetative fuel break. However, I will say that wheatgrass was significantly less than it was at the start of the summer. So like I said, I, the intermediate wheatgrass might slow fire behavior down the start, but by the time we get to the end of August, September, it is you know below 30%. It's basically a dead fuel moisture and it will burn fairly readily. Uh, fast forward to this chart here, there's a lot on here, but basically it's just showing the fuel moisture on the vertical axis and horizontally by date of when it was sampled. Um, so this is really just showing, you know, how did the fuel moisture in these different species change through the fire season? And we can see that uh, blue flax definitely decreased a little bit, curly cup gumweed did. Uh, but like our data that suggests, like I just showed you, forage kosher stayed significantly higher through the whole fire season. Um, so though it does, you know, pose some establishment issues, if you can get established, it's a really good fuel break because of that incredibly high fuel moisture. Intermediate wheatgrass, again, started out all right, but ended up at the end of the summer, it's not going to be an effective fire break. Um, also, we have juniper. I did a couple of juniper samples. Again, like I said, juniper might have high fuel moisture, but we know how volatile it is once it gets burning. So it's very uh, watch out plant species for sure. Um, yeah, and yarrow, also not a terrible one to use. It did stay... It did decline through the fire season, but still stayed relatively high to really help suppress that fire behavior. At least, you know, above 30% fuel moisture is going to help. Uh, one other comment with fuel moisture is that earlier I had hinted that weeds are not always a bad thing. And this picture here is of a wildfire that happened in Truman County last summer. This is off of Fulton Canyon Highway. This is looking at the back end of the fire where it eventually was stopped. Uh, the fire initially started, however, on the other side of this ridge here in a wheat field. Uh, it very quickly ran up the ridge, as you would expect with the slope there, uh, got the top, and the wind started pushing it towards the direction that this was taken from. But you can see um, here kind of on the right where it was eventually stopped. Uh, basically, it went from wheat and it transitioned into a CRP field where they had, you know, intermediate wheatgrass, for example, higher fuel moisture. Um, they also had a lot of skeleton weed uh, in this particular uh, CRP field, and that skeleton weed really helped put that fire out dramatically faster uh, than if it had not been there. So again, you can see they uh, they started harvesting again that field uh, a couple of days after that fire had happened, but you can see where the fire went out here, just how green it looks from here even. So, you know, kind of being a dead horse with the fuel moisture, but it does make a difference at the end of the day. So we were able to determine fuel moisture on those samples. Uh, we also took it a step further, and other researchers have done this as well with wildfire research, that we basically do burn tests, that we try to determine, um, let's say we put a sample on top of this camp stove, how long will it take for it to ignite with this constant flame that's burning on the stove here? And so, you know, usually you would think, well, it's a stove, anything you put on there, it's going to combust instantly. Uh, but a lot of this vegetation actually does take a while for it to actually combust. And so you can determine time to ignition. So it gives you a sense of, you know, say this is a fuel break or vegetation on the roadside. Somebody flicks their cigarette out their window, it lands in there. How long is it going to take for the fuel to ignite? Okay. So this is basically, we're all set up to burn some of these samples. Uh, given this exciting flame, what do you think this is? This was a cheatgrass sample. Uh, that, as you would expect with cheatgrass, it basically ignited instantly uh, and was very hot. However, forage kochia, which I'm, we're trying to burn here, uh, was very stubborn to actually ignite, even with uh, a flame temperature on here of almost 400 degrees Fahrenheit. So just time to ignition with the fuels that we sampled in July. Here you're going to just see that um, cheatgrass, 
you know, basically cheap grass with an instantaneous fire. Um, did not take any time at all. Uh, it was interesting with the, some of these initial ones. Forge Kosha did ignite eventually. Um, you know, I anticipated Forge Kosha would take longer. Uh, but at this stage, the kind of the fuel arrangement of the wheatgrass and the curly cup gumweed made it that it took a lot of heat to make those burn. There just wasn't a lot of fuel there when you, when we were trying to burn these. Um, and I will back up and say, basically, we did weigh out the samples that we burned. They were all 20 gram samples. So we were, we were burning the same mass of fuel to be consistent, uh, but just the arrangement and density of that fuel was hard to be consistent with. And so I think that that led to some of these time for ignition being uh, slightly different than we had anticipated. Uh, now, fast forward into August. Uh, and again, like I said, we had, it was hard running some of these, but this one really made sense to us. So yeah, cheatgrass is still instantaneous, but here you can see that uh, forage kochia and curly cup gumweed, very green. The, the high fuel moisture corresponds with them taking a long time to ignite as well. Uh, yarrow, also not bad. I mean, it takes a lot of the sparks or embers that start some of these fires, you know, often they'll go out within, you know, 10, 20 seconds, half a minute. But if this fuel is, is not going to ignite for at least, you know, a minute, I think that's a pretty good indication that it would be a, suitable for a fuel break. And again, just this is just showing the, that variability of time to ignition for the different species uh, throughout the sampling period. Um, so it was interesting. Forage kosher later in the summer actually was took longer to ignite in general than earlier on. Uh, blue flax was interesting that it, it still took a while to ignite, but it's one that I found out I would caution people to use as a fuel break just because you think about flax oil, it's in the flax seed. Uh, and so once those seeds mature, um, it burned much more explosively and hotter. So again, that all comes back to that chemical composition piece of the fuel as well. Again, cheatgrass was not surprising that basically time to ignition was pretty instantaneous all summer long. By the time we started sampling in mid-July, Basically, the fuel moisture was already fairly low in the cheatgrass, and so that wasn't going to change either. Um, curly cup gumweed and yarrow seed fairly consistent. Uh, intermediate wheatgrass, this makes sense that we saw the fuel moisture decline later in the sampling period. Uh, so again, here you can see intermediate wheatgrass um, decreasing. The time it took for it to ignite decreased later in the fire season. Um, I'll show you this picture because we touched on it earlier, but again, this is from that ember study. And so we mixed it up on one of the burns that we did. And we this is forage kosher we placed basically inside that wheat. And so you see, you saw just how hot those wheat fires got. So it's like, you know, if, if this won't burn with the wheat now, then it, it's going to be kind of a standout um, plant. And so we were pretty amazed that sure enough, we lit off that wheat. And by the time the wheat went out, the forage kosher still had not been ignited. So again, it comes back to that time to ignition. Um, that wheat burned, you know. I don't know, half, half a minute, maybe, maybe 40 seconds. And the kosher, you know, probably would have needed to be active flames next to it for probably another 30 seconds to a minute for it to actually ignite. So that's just how great of a, of a species is the possible use for these fuel breaks. There are other classes available if you're interested. So I designed two online on-demand classes through OSU. I've made some in the past, but these ones are really a step up that they're with OS, OSU, the university, on their online platform, so they're a lot more interactive and, and uh, better source of information than probably my previous classes. Uh, but if you want additional information about you know, wildfire preparedness, uh, this class, Wildfire Preparedness and Ag, really dives into helping people come up with you know, defensible space like we touched on today, but also having you know, some emergency plans in place so that you're more prepared for when a fire does happen. And then there's also this other class, uh, Ag Wildfire Behavior and Suppression, as well. Um, this slide is old. It was in development, but it is now up and running as well. Again, touches more on kind of fire behavior like we were talking about today. A lot of stuff that Rick talked about, I also emphasize some of that as well in this class as well. Um, so just great resources. If you want more information on this stuff, um, it's there if you need it. So. Um, with that, I think we'll wrap this up. Uh, thank you all for being an engaged audience and sticking around. If you got any other questions, let me know. Um, again, I'll send out some more information uh, via email next week.